Hi. Welcome back everybody to the Dolly Cooking Stream, to the cooking show. I hope you're all having a beautiful Friday. If you're currently watching this live, it is Friday, 5 p.m. EST or whatever time it is actually for you over there. Hello to Jack, hello to Trash Can Cat Mom, hello to Lizardic Monkey, hello to Dosky, hello to you ears poked up, hello to Audio Murphy, hello to Kaze. Welcome on in. Hello, hello, hello. And also hello to Crying to Radiohead. Um, hi Zanaltra, hi Jack. Hi, it's good to have all of you. I miss you guys so much. So welcome back. Hope you've all been well. Hope you've all been swell. It's only been a couple of days. Um, I'm pretty excited for what we will be actually cooking today. I'm just going ahead and, uh, you know, turning down my AC a little bit. Also, hello to SMG Hottie. Hi. So, everybody, today we're going to be doing something that I actually have not done before. We're going to be doing a Vietnamese chicken cabbage salad called Goi Ga Bap Kai. Okay, I'm pretty sure you pronounced it right, although there's a lot of accent marks. So I don't think I did that good of a job. Uh, but guys, we're going to be making goi ga bap kai. Uh, and the reason why we're going to be doing this dish today is for a couple of reasons. First of all, something, everybody, I want you all to take notes. I want you all to tap and I really want you all to listen to this part. A lot of what it means to be a good cook, a lot of what it means to be a good home chef especially, is to look at an ingredient and have the basis of knowledge of all the different ways that it is used in different cuisines. And so something very beautiful that I've actually begun to realize is that there is a lot of overlaps in the kinds of ingredients uh, between Mexican uh, and Vietnamese cuisines. So if you are living, you know, and, and if you want to have like a variety of different dishes at home, it is essential that you know all the different ways that different ingredients can be used in the respective cultural context. And so there is a lot of overlaps between Mexican ingredients and also Vietnamese ingredients. So why am I talking about this? Everything that I'm doing today is because I had stuff in my fridge that I needed to get rid of. I had some limes, I had some cilantro, I had some cabbage. Okay, and I was also looking to use up a little bit of chicken. And so I was doing some research and I don't actually know all that much about Vietnamese cuisine. I don't know nearly as much as I would actually like to. And so a lot of what this is for me today is me getting more comfortable slowly over time with doing a couple of things that I don't know. I know a lot when it comes to Mexican food. I know a lot when it comes to, you know, French cooking. I don't know necessarily the most about Vietnamese cooking. And so this is an attempt for me um, to get a little bit more comfortable with it. It's not gonna be any new techniques per se, but it's gonna have a lot of components. Is this the chicken from Wednesday? Yes, it is crying radio head. And we'll talk about why we're doing that and what we'll be doing with it. Um, so guys, this is Goi Ga Bap Kai. Uh, this is a Vietnamese chicken cabbage salad. and has a lot of components going inside of it. So you have pickled red onions that go inside of it. In this case, we'll be actually doing pickled shallots. You have crispy shallots, which are typically added on as a topping. We're going to have some roasted peanuts. So we're going to walk through the process of actually doing that. I don't typically roast peanuts. I don't typically make crispy shallots. We'll decide how realistic all of these things are to do actually in a home setting. We'll make a new batch of pickled onions. Um, it's going to be amazing. It's going to be really delicious, guys. We're going to go ahead and gently poach the chicken as well. So let's go ahead and walk through all of our ingredients. So as always, guys, we start off with some chicken. I have some two, I have two legs and I have two thighs. And this is the beauty of buying whole chickens, guys. A couple days ago, through the Wednesday stream, we bought a whole chicken. And what I did was we took the carcass of it off and it's currently being made into a beautiful chicken stock. We used up the breast, we used up the tenders, and now the legs and the thighs will be made into this lovely goi ga bap kai. Um, and so, what we'll need to do is we're going to gently poach it. So guys, think about my technique that I was using for the Hainanese chicken rice. We're going to do these in cold water with a bunch of aromatics. Um, you know, you can do this in water, you don't have to do this in chicken stock, but because I already had the chicken bones, I thought it would be a very nice way to go ahead and use them up. So we're going to be gently, gently, beautifully poaching these. We're going to go ahead and shred them up and it's going to be fantastic. It's gonna be really delicious. Okay, so that was one of the things that I wanted to use up today. Guys, next, I have two limes, a uh, couple cat, uh, like half a head of cabbage, and then some shallots. This is what it means. Everybody, are you listening? I want to hear the nice resounding yes chef from everybody watching. Please and thank you. This is what it means to cook at home. Also, hello, just a crazy cookie. Welcome on in. This is what it means to cook at home. This is the epitome of home cooking. I looked in my fridge and I was like, okay, I don't want to throw out my cabbage. I don't want to throw out all these different things. I want to use them before they go bad. Everybody, what it means to cook at home is the intersection between what you want and what you have to use up. You can't always make everything that you always want to eat 110% of the time. 
you're going to have to look at what you already have and then you have a basis of all these you know different recipes you have a basis of all these different cultures cuisines dishes and then you take some inspiration and you buy other things that you need to actually make it but what it means to cook at home is to mitigate waste because food is expensive in this day and age food is incredibly expensive and so we don't want to waste anything we don't want any of it to go bad and so that's what I'm trying to inspire all of you to do I'm trying to inspire you to look at your fridge use up your produce before it goes bad and show you different creative ways of using up said produce you know it doesn't always have to be done in the same way so guys of course the cabbage this is going to be shredded up and it's going to be the basis of the salad uh, these shallots here they're going to become crispy fried shallots um, and I don't normally love deep frying at home so we'll actually see how good of a job we end up doing because we might just decide that it was completely useless and a waste of time and then we also have some limes the limes are going to go of course into uh, the uh, the dressing the dipping sauce okay let's talk about some other components that we have guys so another thing that I wanted to go ahead and use up today was some Serrano chilies now traditionally for this especially the dipping sauce that we're doing we would use a Thai bird's eye chili but guess what I did not have a Thai bird's eye chili so instead I'm just going to be using a Serrano and guys this is the beauty of cooking you don't necessarily need to have everything be 110% authentic this needs to be authentic to your home kitchen so if a recipe calls for the bird's eye chili but you have another type of spicy chili just use the kind of spicy chili that you already have and Instead of going out of your way to buy something else that you might not use the rest of so use what you have first and foremost okay so I didn't go out of my way to buy red onions for the pickled red onions I already had shallots so we're gonna make uh, pickled shallots so these shallots are gonna be used for the pickled shallots guys and then we have some ginger this is going to go into the sauce and the poaching liquid for the chicken we have some garlic guys you can't have Vietnamese cooking without garlic Vietnamese cooking big bold flavors lots of pungency right lots of spice lots of acidity um, lots of aromatics things like garlic things like ginger things like chilies okay moving on we have of course also a big bundle of scallions so the scallion whites the bottoms are going to go into the poaching liquid for the chicken it's going to make a really lovely delicious aromatic stock for us and then we're going to go ahead and slice up some of the scallions as well and throw it on into the salad okay uh, then guys we have some fish sauce you really cannot have Vietnamese food without fish sauce this is the squid brand fish sauce um, you know I think this is actually a Thai fish sauce it's what I have I'm not gonna go out of my way to buy specifically Vietnamese fish sauce there's a lot of overlaps of course guys this if you want to be cooking Vietnamese things uh, at home if you want to make Vietnamese food you need to keep fish sauce you need to keep um, it's just in almost every single dish available and so uh, you also want to keep this in the fridge uh, I actually find that fish sauce does degrade over time a little bit faster it's really fermented it's really really funky uh, it's really really salty it brings everything a lot of oomph uh, if you smell it and taste it by itself it's not particularly delicious but once you mix it with other strong flavors right like the lime like the garlic like the chilies all of that like fishiness and that funkiness uh, does end up dissipating so guys you gotta have fish sauce this is not even an option you need to have fish sauce this is not an ing white people love being afraid of fish sauce this is not an ingredient that you want to stray away from this is not something that you just want to eat by itself though okay um what else do we have okay we also have a nice big bag of peanuts these are some raw peanuts um, so we're going to go ahead and take them out of the shell and make some roasted peanuts out of them and then guys of course again this is what I was talking about of the overlap this isn't Vietnamese coriander but this is coriander from my local supermarket I just have some fresh cilantro here guys this is what I'm talking about in terms of the intersection between uh, different cuisines and the different cultures and the different ingredients and the beauty is when you keep a fridge stocked with things like cilantro and shallots and you keep it stocked with limes you don't just have to do Mexican food right there's so many ingredients that are really really similar to Vietnamese cooking that will do an excellent job of subbing on in right and that is what it means to cook at home when you don't just because guys listen unless you want to always make food from a certain cuisine right it gets a little bit boring I want to go ahead and go all around the world but you can't just buy a million different things you have to go ahead and look at the overlap is that clear I want to hear a nice resounding yes chef okay so that's all of the ingredients um, we have to make roasted peanuts we have to make the ginger lime uh, fish sauce dressing we have to poach the chicken we have to make the pickled onions and we have to make the crispy shallots and then shred the components for the salad we have so much that we need to do for today's salad guys so this is a Friday we're going to go a little bit crazy on it we're going to take a lot of time with everything 
Um, guys, for those of you that have not already done so, please check out my Patreon. You can type an exclamation mark Patreon in the chat, or you just scroll down and go into the About section, um, because I'm trying to make the cooking streams a full-time thing. I want to run this like a cooking show, and thus, any and all support will be appreciated. So, the first step of today, guys, we're going to be making the pickled shallots. I want to have some nice, delicious pickled salads to go ahead, uh, shallots, excuse me, to go ahead and throw on into the salad. So, uh, let's just go ahead and get that started. Um, let's just head on over to my cutting board. Also, wait, actually, one more heads up. Um, we don't have to talk about it on the stream. I'd actually really prefer if you guys don't mention it explicitly. This Sunday, there is no cooking stream. I know it was originally scheduled. It's originally up on the schedule. There is no cooking stream this Sunday. Had some personal events in my life take place. Uh, but we will be back this Monday. So this Monday, as scheduled, as planned, we'll have a stream instead. I'm really sorry to miss the Sunday stream, guys. As always, uh, Monday, 5 p.m. EST. So, everybody, are you ready to begin? Are you ready to begin the pickled shallots? I want to hear a nice resounding yes chef from everybody watching and listening and tuning on in. Even if it's your first time here, even if you're new, I want to hear a nice resounding yes chef. Good. That's what I'm talking about. I guess. I can't believe that SMG hottie. You have to say yes chef. That's the whole point of the show. So guys, let's go ahead and go on over to my cutting board. Um, and the reason we want to get uh, the pickled shallots done out of the way in advance is because we want to go ahead and give it some time to chill out in the fridge. So, guys, as always, I have my cutting board on a wet paper towel. The wet paper towel is going to go ahead and give it a little bit more friction and it's going to stop it from sliding around as easily. Although, because of the fact that I had it folded up, it wasn't doing as good of a job as it could have. There you go, something like that. So, nice wet paper towel under my cutting board. And now guys, let's go ahead and proceed with the shallots. I don't need to make like a crazy amount of uh, pickled shallots for today. I'm only going to need like these three. Okay. And so guys, um, we're going to be doing a quick pickle. This is not a full on proper real pickle, right? It's not going to be something that you can leave outside of the fridge. But I love having quick pickled things at home in the fridge. The beauty of a quick pickled shallot is Whoa. The beauty of a quick pickled shallot is, or, you know, like a quick pickled onion, is that you can put it on salads, you can put it on soups, you can put it on beans, you can put it on stews, you can put it in tacos and sandwiches. Pickled onions have so much use in the kitchen. Do not sleep on pickled onions. Okay? So, in this case, we're doing some pickled shallots instead of pickled red onions, which is what I usually do. Although you can use any kind of allium if you would like. We're going to go ahead and start by just cutting off the head of each of my little shallots. Beautiful. Beautiful, excellent. And this one as well, lovely. And so guys, sometimes they do develop like, um, like their own like little membrane, their own little skin. So what you have to do is you have to physically go in there and you wanna go ahead and just sort of break them up a little bit more, right? Because um, that's just sort of the way that they end up growing. You ate half a pound of caramelized onions. Caramelized onions are so good crying to Radiohead. And as always, by the way, if you have any cooking questions whatsoever, I'm here to help you answer them. So guys, we wanna go ahead and separate these because of course, uh, we wanna go ahead and get rid of all of that like super papery inner skin, right? That stuff is really, really unpleasant. It's not something that we wanna be eating at all. So let's go ahead and get this last one out. This one is going to need a little bit of help for my knife just to make that initial incision. And I broke it. Uh-oh, that's annoying. Okay, there we go. Lovely. And now we're going to go through every single one of these shallots, guys, and we're going to just go ahead and slice them in half through the root of it. Slice them in half, and we slice it in half because we're looking to still keep the root of it intact. Actually, it depends on the kind of slice that we'll be doing. We'll see how I feel in a second. But by splitting it in half, we'll of course be able to easily, easily peel up that shallot. Okay, there we go. And now guys, let's go ahead and get a peeling station ready to go. As always, when you cook at home, I want to hear a nice resounding yes chef. You want to have a waste bowl. You don't want to go ahead and keep throwing things away into the trash can. You will end up dirtying one dish, but you're going to go ahead and make your life a lot easier. Also, hello Shinji, welcome on in. Also, Taza, hello, hello, hello. So guys, we're just going through every single one of these shallots and we're giving it a quick little peel, right? Because that skin is papery, it's unpleasant. We don't want anything to do with it whatsoever. I love shallots. Um, if you want to talk about like the difference between like a red onion and a shallot, a shallot tends to be a little bit sweeter, it tends to be a little bit more pungent. Although at the end of the day, the beauty of and the creativity of the cooking, what I love about cooking is that so many different things are actually interchangeable. So anywhere where you see like a recipe call for a shallot, is it going to be exactly the same if you sub in an onion? No, but it's just going to be different. Alliums are so interchangeable because they have 
They're similar enough that they can be interchangeable, but they're still also different that they bring something else to the party. Okay. So we're just going through all of these shallots, guys. Give them a little peel. This one is going to need an extra peel. This one's a little bit older. It looks like just ended up developing more skin. Just avoid over peeling these so you don't, you don't lose the majority of your shallots or anything. Okay, lovely. A little bit more to go, guys. Does anybody have any questions about this process thus far? Today, nothing is going to be super technical. We just have a lot to get done for the Goiga Kai. I'm really, really excited for it. This is not actually something... So here's the thing. Um, typically on stream, when I'm trying a new dish, it's usually food that I see in restaurants that I was like, oh, okay, I would, I think this would be well adaptable into a home setting. This is not one of those things. I've never actually eaten goi ga bap kai before, or at least knowingly. And so, what I want to do today, when I'm trying out a new dish like this, is first of all, I want to go ahead and experiment for myself and get more comfortable with Vietnamese cooking overall. So I'm going to go ahead and just clean this up a little bit. Um, just get rid of all of these different shallot skins off of my cutting board. Lovely. But yeah, um, I wanted to go ahead and basically just see, hey, how feasible is it to do this kind of a salad in a home setting? Because everything that I want to teach, guys, is home food. I want to put things in a fridge that are able to last well. I want to put things in a fridge that, that can be reheated easily. I want to have things that are nice and accessible in a home setting. Um, as for the amount of components, that's like the biggest deterrent thus far, but I want to go ahead and experiment with things that I'm a little bit newer to. So guys, for the pickled shallots, here's what you and I are going to need. We're going to go ahead and need a nice little uh, glass Tupperware, or you can use a jar, and we're going to go ahead and start laying out the sliced shallots in here. You don't want these to be too thin, you don't want these to be too thick, okay? Please and thank you, a yes chef. Just like Audio Murphy, already ahead of the curve. Not too thin, not too thick. Because if they're a little bit too thin, when we do pour in that hot pickling solution, what's going to happen is uh, it's going to immediately soften the shallots and they're going to basically become mush. If it's a little bit too thick, uh, we're not going to actually get, um, you know, the proper texture of a pickled shallot. So why do we use shallots, by the way? So really good question. Uh, you see this a lot in South Asian or Southeast Asian, I believe, uh, Southwest Asian? Southeast Asian, I think Southeast Asian cooking. You see shallots all the time because shallots are incredibly aromatic. But why am I specifically using pickled shallots, not pickled red onions? Let me tell you why. For the crispy shallots, I already had to buy a sack of shallots. And then I have a bunch of leftover shallots. So I'm not going to go out of my way to buy a red onion to do a pickled onion when I already have something that I could pickle just as well. But as an aromatic component, shallots are prized for their aromatic quality. Okay. So I hope that answers your question. So let's just keep on going through, guys. Let's keep on processing up all of my lovely little shallots. Just slicing, slicing, slicing. Once again, not too thin, not too thick. For these bad boys, excellent. Nice and easy. This is a lot of shallots. Oh my goodness. I'm actually kind of getting annoyed with saying shallot. Although it is a very fun word to say. Are just onions cosplaying as garlic? So true. They're like, ooh, I accidentally just flung a piece of allium through my hands. I'm not saying that word anymore. Okay, guys, I'm going to go ahead and just pick all of this up. I'm going to go ahead and take it, and I'm going to go ahead and put everything in here. Lovely. Right into my glass container, ready to go. I'm not going to answer your question, WW. These are my alliums. So I'm just going through all of it. I'm going ahead and I'm slicing all of it up, guys. Okay, until we're done, and we've fully processed all of my, my vegetable. Does anybody have any questions about this process so far? But yeah, I love, love, love having any type of like pickled onion, any type of pickled allium at home, guys. They have so much use, they have so much versatility. Okay, they have so much that they can actually bring to the table. Okay. Um, I'm actually trying to decide how much I want to do um, because I'm looking at this amount and I'm already like, that's a generous amount. Um, so let's just keep going through. Maybe we'll do a couple more and we'll save the rest of them for the crispy fried shallots. I said it again, didn't I? I completely neglected it. Okay. It's fine. Good afternoon, Sniper. Hello, hello, hello. Okay. 
and just dumping all of them in. Okay guys, what do you think? Do you think we need to make some more of these? Eh, let's go ahead and make some more. Again, these are just really, really nice to have. You can't have too many pickled alliums in your fridge, right? This is one of those things that's just like, it's always gonna be good, it's always gonna be there for you. It's always going to do exactly for you what you want it to do. So I don't mind uh, having a plethora of these. That's right, yeah. They, and, and they do hold in the fridge exceptionally well, right? You can, at, you can keep them in there for at least a couple of weeks, um, as long as they're refrigerated. You cannot keep quick pickled vegetables um, outside of the fridge. So that's like the distinction between like a real proper canned pickle, right? versus uh, something like this. It's something that I love clarifying, just in case anybody gets any misconceptions about food safety. Go ahead and take that and dump all of that in. Whoa, there's so many to go through. I'm getting kind of sick of cutting them. You know what, I think, no, 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 no. I'm not gonna be lazy. I'm not gonna be lazy, chat. I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna do it just fine. Let's go ahead and persevere. And also, they are substantially more pungent than onions are. Jack, please don't count my voice cracks. I'd really appreciate it if you did not do that. Okay, and just going through all of it. Two more to go. Two more little teeny tiny halves to go. In fact, I could probably just stack them up and make my life substantially easier at this point. Yeah, I don't know why I was doing them one at a time like that. That was ridiculous. There you go. Perfect. And again, I'm not looking for them to be too big or anything. I'm not looking for them to be too thin either. We're looking for like a very nice middle ground, a very nice intersection. Okay. And we're going to go ahead and scoop all of them up, guys. Just plop them on in. All right. And now let's talk about the other components that we want here. Now, you don't necessarily have to add anything else into your pickled alliums. You don't have to do anything else if you don't want to. But I do love having a couple of other aromatic components. One of which, of course, being some garlic. So I'm going to go ahead and just take two garlic cloves, two of these bad boys, and all I'm gonna do, guys, I'm gonna give them a nice little smash so that we get some of the pungency of the garlic. Because the more you actually end up crushing garlic, the more of its flavor in the form of Allison is actually produced. And I want that pungency, I want that intensity. That's what, in my mind, Vietnamese cooking is all about. Vietnamese cooking is the balance of a lot of strong flavors for me, right? A lot of pungency, a lot of spice, a lot of fermentation, a lot of acid, right? It's just everything like turning up to 110%. So, let's go ahead and get two of these cloves of garlic inside. So, you know, not that much garlic. Um, the other thing that I wanted to do is I have some of these chilies that I wanted to use up, of course. And so I was thinking, a really nice way of using up these chilies. Um, I'm going to go ahead and have one of them go into the sauce today. Two of the chilies, seeds and all, are going to go directly into the pickled shallots. So I want that heat, guys. I want that heat, I want that punch. Um, let's go ahead and think about how I actually want to cut these up. Um, I think I'm going to go ahead and just, uh, you know, we're just gonna go ahead and cut nice, thin, little shavings, well not super thin, but something like this. Because a nice byproduct you're going to get is the pickled chilies as well. So we're not using bird's eye, and I'm gonna tell you exactly why you're nameless. In cooking, one of the most cool things to me is that so many different ingredients are incredibly interchangeable. I already had serranos in my fridge. If I was shopping for chilies for this recipe, then I would buy bird's eyes. But because I already had some serranos, that's why I'm using up the serranos, okay? Because when it comes to home cooking, the first thing and the most important thing is making sure that it's not just authentic, but it's authentic to your home kitchen. And so serranos, do they taste exactly the same as bird's eyes? Not at all, right? They have a little bit of a less kick um, and they're a little bit more vegetal than a bird's eye, but it's still going to do a very similar job and it's going to make this authentic to my home kitchen. I am basically localizing this, right? I'm localizing this, I already have the chilies, uh, I already have the serranos, so I'm gonna go ahead and use them. So guys, those are going to be my aromatics. So my garlic, my shallots, and my chilies as well. They're all going to get beautifully and lovely pickled. Um, and guys, once again, I want to encourage all of you, please, 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 get into the habit of doing this at home. Quick pickled onions, quick pickled shallots, they're so easy to do. So, let's go ahead and move on. We have to now build the brine, guys. We're going to have to heat this up a little bit. And we want to heat up the brine because it's going to give us basically half-cooked vegetables that, and uh, it will then allow it to really penetrate it. Okay, it's going to penetrate, it's going to kill some of the natural pungency of the shallots, um, but it's the, the brine, the acidity, the sugar, all of it is going to penetrate beautifully. So, I have some vinegar here. Um, this is a mixture of white distilled vinegar and Filipino uh, cane vinegar, I believe, cane and coconut vinegar. 
Um, is this traditionalness? No, but this was all the vinegar that I actually had at home. And so the beauty of doing a quick pickle is that you don't actually need exact ratios. So we're going to go in, it's a roughly one to one ratio. So I'm doing maybe like half a cup, okay? Half a cup. And then I'm also going to do a similar amount. It doesn't have to be exactly the same, guys. It doesn't have to be an exact science. You don't have to weigh this out or anything. We're going to go ahead and pour all of that on in. Lovely, we no longer need this little teacup. I'm not using a measuring cup. I'm not weighing anything out, guys. I'm not doing anything. Oh, I have some I can use up. I don't, I'm not doing anything crazy like that, guys. I'm just putting it in and letting it happen, okay? Okay, next, we're going to need a good amount of sugar. I don't normally love cooking with sugar. Uh, and by good amount, I do mean a couple of spoons. I see some people, they go up as high as like a quarter cup of sugar, which I think is personally insane for quick pickled onions. But I will say after having tried it with sugar and no sugar, I do actually prefer it with that little bit of sweetness. Um, so I'm only going to do like one to two teaspoons of sugar, maybe three. That's how I'm feeling for today. Three heaping teaspoons of sugar, and then we're going to need the sugar a little bit later on for the dressing. Uh, the sweet component, the sweet flavor in Vietnamese cooking is actually pretty essential. Um, as you guys may know, I oftentimes do preach about, uh, I, I really do preach about often, um, you know, not cooking with sugar, not adding excess sugar, but because this is my first time actually making this dish, and one of my first times ever making Vietnamese food, I don't actually want to mess with it too much. Okay, I want to sort of respect it and see where it's at, and then I'm going to experiment with it and then try to make it my own. I'm not going to try and make uh, something really my own and use all these different ingredients and all these different substitutions and change the concept until I feel like I've given the original dish enough respect and try to really understand what it's trying to do. So I'm gonna do a little pinch of salt, and then one of my additions that I really like doing, um, we're going to go ahead and get some coriander seeds. Um, and guys, this is how customizable pickled alliums are. You get so many choices, you get so many options. So I'm just adding in a few coriander seeds right inside because coriander cilantro is very contextual in Vietnamese cooking for me, right? So we have the chilies, we have the heat, we have the garlic. And now guys, let's go ahead and get this on over to the stove. Let's go to the stove. And that's my pressure cooker going as well. I'm gonna just go ahead and shut that off. So, why are we actually bringing this up to heat? Why are we actually bringing this up to a boil? Well, it's two things. First of all, it's functional because it's dissolving the sugar. It's dissolving the sugar and it's dissolving the salt um, into the brine itself. The second thing that this is actually accomplishing is that when we heat it up and we bring it up to a boil properly, what's going to happen is when we pour it over the shallots, when we pour it over the chilies, it's really going to do an incredible job of slightly softening it, but then penetrating it um, and doing so in a quick fashion. You don't actually have to heat it up like this. You could theoretically just do a cold quick pickle, um, but the consequence of doing that is that it takes a lot longer. And because we have to actually do a you know cooking stream within a certain amount of time, time is not a luxury that I actually have. Does everybody understand? Can I please get a yes, chef? Please and thank you from everybody watching. Um, in the meantime, I'm gonna go ahead and quickly rinse off my knife because um, it is now covered in you know liquid stuff and wet stuff and acidic stuff. Um, and it's a carbon steel knife, right? So it's reactive. If you have a stainless steel knife, you don't have to do this. But with a carbon steel knife, you have to wipe it off basically you know, every so often and make sure that it's staying nice and dry. Also, welcome on in, um, Spiff. Hello, hello. How'd you find the show? How'd you find the stream? It's lovely to have you. I am, and by the way, if anybody has any questions whatsoever at any point in time, I'm here to help you learn how to cook. And I'm not just here to help you learn how to cook as a novelty. I'm here to help you learn how to cook at home. I'm here to help you cook in a home setting to teach you what it means to really build up a home ecosystem of ingredients and techniques and knowledge um, and to feel comfortable in a home setting. You a fan of my casting? Well, it's lovely to have you, Spiff. Uh, do you know me from Smash Your Hollow? I'm curious. Well, at any rate, it's lovely to have you. So guys, once again, we're just going to go ahead and boil this. You don't really have to stir it or anything. You can if you feel like the sugar is sticking to the bottom. Um, but really, all we need to do is just go ahead and bring this bad boy on up to a boil. Okay, so let's talk about what's going to happen after. Let's head back on over to the cutting board. So guys, once again, look at this beautiful collection. Right? Look how, look how gorgeous it is. Oh, you're here from Natalie's footer? I see. Um, look at this gorgeous collection, guys. We have the chilies, we have the garlic, uh, and we have the shallots as well. I'm going to go ahead and take this little container and I'm going to put it on a little teeny tiny plate like so. Lovely. And in fact, I'm actually feeling one more addition, guys. And again, these are incredibly just entirely up to you, 
right? The way that you do your pickled onions, you have so much room for so many different aromatics, okay? So uh, I'm going to, I have some cilantro. Why not just stuff some in? There is no way it won't be good. In fact, the only thing I just wanna make sure of is I wanna make sure that the cilantro is buried under all of it. That's okay, Jack. Thank you for stopping by. Your presence is appreciated as always. So I'm just going to go ahead and just take it and I'm just gonna stuff it on in. Right, because I don't want it exposed. I want it to actually be fully submerged in all of that brand. I want all of this stuff nicely and beautifully and tightly packed. Okay, guys, here's a mistake that you can make. This is a really good huge mistake. So I want all of you to tap in. I want all of you to listen. I want to hear a nice yes, chef. The worst thing that you can do with any Tupperware, especially the glass Tupperware, is when you pour in the boiling brine to immediately put a lid on it and then put it into the fridge. When you do that, you're trapping in all of that heat and you are just essentially thermally shocking the glass. Your glass can easily rupture. By going from cold to hot, or excuse me, from hot to cold, right, the boiling water into the cold refrigerator, you could crack the glass and depending on the volume of boiling liquid that you could have, it might also not be so good for your fridge. So guys, all I'm really looking to do right now, I'm just looking to dissolve the sugar. Uh, if I feel like the sugar is not dissolving, I mean, I'm just gonna go ahead and just take something to just stir it up at the bottom, just to break it up a little bit. And again, I'm using a Filipino cane vinegar. You can use any kind that you would like. You can use white distilled, it really doesn't matter. And that is the beauty of making pickled shallots. That is the beauty of making pickled onions. That hair makes me look. Guys, uh, also, hello to Cyber Goth Foods. Welcome on in. Um, yeah, that is, that is, there is so much room for creativity with something like this. You can figure out what kind of vinegar, uh, vinegar do I like? What kind of seasonings do I like? What kind of alum do I like? What kind of spices do I like? You have so much room to play around with. And so, when you're making this for yourself, I don't want you to have to uh, necessarily copy this. Okay? So, guys, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to take all of this and I'm going to pour... Whew, the vinegar just hit my nose. Oh my goodness. Yeah, that is, that is acidic. We're going to take it and we're going to pour all of it in. And the only thing that we're really going to make sure of is that we go ahead and press it all down. Lovely. Okay, and um, some people, what they do though, um, so to actually make sure that everything on top is covered by the brine, what they do is they take like a paper towel, a food safe paper towel, of course. I don't actually know if paper towels aren't food safe, but you know, I haven't died yet. And then I'm just going to go ahead and just take any tool that I possibly can to just, uh, you know, just make sure that this is nice and soaked. And this is going to keep everything down and covered in all of that brine, okay? No, you don't have to leave. It's, it's lovely to have you, just don't call me that. Um, so can all types of vinegar be used for pickling or does some vinegar taste too strong for pickling? Uh, that's a very good question, crying to Radiohead. Here's my recommendation for you, literally, Take a type of vinegar that you would like to theoretically pickle with and just taste it. Just taste it and compare it to something like a white distilled vinegar. Off the top of my head, there is nothing that comes to mind besides uh, balsamic vinegar. That is the only one that I feel like I would not want to do a pickled onion with. Right, because that one is like, you know, fairly concentrated. So uh, a pickled onion would not be so good with, uh, you know, balsamic. So, guys. Once again, we're just making sure that the paper towel is covering everything, and that's it. That's all of the work that we need to do for one of our essential, essential components for today. You want to go ahead and let this cool off at room temperature for like 30, 40 minutes, and then we're going to go ahead and put it onto the fridge. You don't want to go from boiling to the fridge. Can I please get a yes, chef? Please and thank you. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and take this, and I'm going to go ahead and put this all behind me, put it into the past. Lovely. Just taking a second to make some space, and I'm also going to go ahead and release the pressure on my pressure cooker. Okay guys, so let's talk about the next component that we actually need for today's salad. So, once again, we're doing a goi ga bak thai. Goi ga bak thai is a Vietnamese uh, chicken cabbage salad. And now let's talk about the actual chicken component. We want to do a gently poached chicken, and I don't mean I want you all to listen right now. I want all of you to tap in. I do not mean a boiled chicken breast to death that's completely dry and tasteless and shredded into oblivion. We're going to poach it. We're not boiling, we're poaching. You might be asking me, oh, Duram girl, what's the difference between boiling and poaching? Well, let me explain. Boiling is when you take water up to a boil, aggressively bubbling, and you're keeping it at 100 degrees Celsius, and you're heating everything inside like that. There is a very huge problem when it comes to boiling meat. When you boil any meat that's not like hot pot sliced, right? when it's not like super, super thin, 
to get it to actually cook through, the outside will become so overcooked by the time that the inside is done. You're going to get dry, rubbery, um, almost like a powdery meat on the outside. Okay? And the inside is just by the time that you actually want the inside to be done. But we're going to poach it. Poaching takes place, you know, it's a, it's a cooking term, um, when you have hot water. Right? So it's going to be just barely bubbling, just before you simmer. Very little bubbles, and I'm going to show you exactly what that looks like. And so the beauty is, by gently, gently poaching it for a longer period of time, we're going to have evenly cooked chicken without the outside of it becoming basically boiled to death and into oblivion. Okay, so I don't want you boiling your chicken. I don't want you boiling it. I don't want you destroying it. Okay, unless you're doing like a hot pot with thinly sliced meat, I want you to poach it. I want to get a yes chef right now. Please and thank you. It's important. It's really, really serious. Um, so, okay, for the poaching of the chicken food today, uh, you could theoretically just use water. I am using chicken stock because we had the chicken carcass from Wednesday, from the time that we broke down a whole chicken. And so I thought this would be a really, really nice ways uh, of just using that up today, right? We made a chicken stock. Uh, I did this beforehand, I did this before the stream. I'm going to go ahead and show off what my chicken stock looks like in just a moment's time. So once my pressure cooker is done releasing the pressure. Um, I know I didn't show you how to do that on stream. Uh, we do chicken stocks all the time on stream. I just didn't think that we had the time today. Also, um, does anybody have any questions? If you haven't already done so, please check out my Patreon. Type in exclamation mark Patreon in the chat. Scroll down, go into the about section. Um, I'm looking to make this a full-time thing. I would love any and all support. It would be really appreciated. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and just take out my big, beautiful pot of stock. Excellent. And of course, we're not going to be using all of the chicken stock food today. So let's head on over to the stove, guys. Let's head to the stove. And this is my gorgeous, lovely pot of chicken stock. So this is something that I want to talk to all of you about really quickly. One of the best ways to level up, and I hate using the word level up, but I really do mean it in this case. One of the best ways to possibly level up the cooking that you do at home is to make your own homemade chicken stocks. And the way that you get into the habit of making chicken stocks is by building up a system of having chicken bones at home. And to have a system of chicken bones, you have to have whole chickens. I don't want you going out of your way to specifically buy chicken bones for something that is indeed a byproduct. Okay, so. Uh, what's the ball thingy floating around in my stock? So that is just an onion. I have some onion, I have some garlic, I have some peppercorns, some bay leaves, and of course the chicken itself. Um, the chicken carcass itself. It's nice, it's beautiful, it's golden. You don't have to make the poached chicken in the chicken stock, but I think I just really want like a nice delicious sipping stock afterwards. Um, so we're going to just go ahead and ladle some in into that pot, uh, into the pot that I have set aside behind us in just a moment's time. This is, in, this is the vessel in which we'll be actually making the poached chicken for today, okay? So let's just go ahead and get that set up. Uh, could I use a pot from the Instant Pot on the stove? You can, you can, although I don't typically recommend it because it's not the best for it. The only way that I would actually use that, like I would use the Instant Pot on the stove, would be if I'm boiling something, but I would never saute with it, okay? Um, because you can warp it over time for sure. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and just have a little sip of water. Okay, guys. So let's go ahead and start thinking. Um, I don't think you can use a non-stick pot. Not the non-stick pot though. The non-stick pot cannot be used on the flame, I believe. I just hope that's known and an important clarification to make. So guys, let's go back on over to the cutting board. And so when we're talking about byproducts, one of the best byproducts that you could possibly have guys is your scallion bottoms. Okay, so these white parts right here, after you give them a good wash to make sure that there is no sand, that there is no dirt on them whatsoever, we're just going to go ahead and stack all of them up. These are pretty tiny scallions for you today, my goodness. Little teeny tiny baby scallions, okay? And we're going to go ahead and cut all of these off, but we're not throwing it away. One of the best uses for it is in a stock. I wouldn't add this into the beginning of a stock though, because they do fall apart really quickly and become mush. Um, I would add this within like the last 30 minutes or so. Well, in this case, the chicken's only going to cook for 30 minutes to an hour. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and take these little scallion uh, bottoms and I'm going to go ahead and throw that on into the pot as well. Okay. Next component that we're going to need for today's poaching liquid, guys, is going to be some ginger. Okay, and again, we don't want to mince any of this stuff. We want to go ahead and have it in big pieces so that we're easily able to pluck it out. The goal of this is to flavor the cooking liquid of the chicken and to slightly flavor the outside of the chicken. 
Okay, so let's go ahead and just take this. Uh, we're gonna take like a little piece of ginger. You can easily have too much ginger in cooking, guys. Um, you don't need anything more than this, and we don't wanna chop it or anything. Um, all I'm going to do is I'm just going to peel it off. You can use the spoon to peel, peel it off if you would really like. Um, ginger does tend to really vary as well in its pungency. I forgot if it gets like stronger uh, as it's older or younger. I re Ooh, actually, I should have my gloves for this because this is pretty bad for my hands. I have eczema. Um, and ginger has been consistently one of the things that does mess me up the most. Okay. Just go ahead and glove on up. Okay, excellent. And I'm just gonna go ahead and peel it. And again, you don't really have to peel it if you're just gonna wash it, right? But I didn't wash my ginger or anything, right? So it's a little bit dirty. So I'm just peeling it up, getting that done. And now, I know Spiff, that's what I'm saying. I've been saying this for a long time. And now guys, all we're going to do is we're going to give it a quick little tap, a little mash, just once again in terms of uh, extraction of flavor. Right? That's what this is for. Um, that's a lot of ginger. I don't think it'll be too much. Again, you don't want to slice this thin or anything. You just want to have it like this and then we'll take it out after. Okay, nice and easy. So ginger going inside. And now the next step guys, we're going to need some garlic cloves once again for the aroma, for the flavor. Um, let's go ahead and get a couple of garlic cloves. Same exact idea as before, by the way. You don't want to chop this. You don't want to mince this, right? We're just going to do three, three garlic cloves, just like that. That'll be more than fine. We don't want to chop it. We don't want to mince it. We just want it to still be fine enough, or well, big enough, excuse me, that we can then easily pluck it out after. So give it a little tap. Give it a little tap. And we're tapping it um, to both half crush it and again, develop some of that pungency. But then also to simultaneously uh, get rid of the skin. Right? so that we don't have to worry about the dirty skin sort of floating around in the pot. So there you go, that's one, and that's two, and that's three. Excellent, let's go ahead and get the garlic onto the pot as well. Beautiful. And I'm going to go ahead and just clean up my station using my bench scraper as always. And now, uh, the final component guys, is actually just going to be, is it just gonna be the chicken now? I think it's just going to be the chicken now. You got a McDonald's ad when you got here? That's crazy. You know what sucks? Even if you turn off pre-roll ads on Twitch, it's still going to give you ads no matter what. It's really unfortunate. Also, hello, Masters, you know, welcome on in. Um, okay. So guys, here's what we're going to do. We're going to go ahead and put all of my lovely chicken pieces into the pot with the garlic, with the ginger, with the scallions. I should have actually probably put the, uh, uh, the aromatic, excuse me, afterwards, so they're, they're on top. And like properly submerged and stuff. So all the chicken going on now. Lovely. Let's go ahead and get rid of that dirty contaminated plate. Everybody please say thank you to Mrs. Plate. She did a wonderful job for us today. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah, that is a tragedy. I have turned off all ads because I wanna have an ad free stream as much as I possibly can, you know? Um, okay guys, and we're going to go ahead and just, we're just doing this to roughly season it. A lot of the salt is going to dissolve in the water. Also possum. Thank you so much for the sub. Thank you, thank you. Lovely. I'm happy to hear it, possum. So guys, I'm going to go ahead and just generously season this. And I want to go ahead and mention my stock doesn't actually have any existing salt in it. Because we don't know what we're going to use it for. I'm not going to use all the stock food today, right? And so, by having it be really intentionally bland, we can go ahead and give it a variety of uses. But right now, we're seasoning the chicken to make sure that all that salt will be able to just beautifully penetrate. Okay, and now I'm just going to go ahead and ladle in my delicious homemade chicken stock, nice and golden from that onion, nice and full of all of that gelatin. And again, you can use water if you don't have any chicken stock at home. Don't use box chicken stock. If you have to use an instant chicken stock, I would use something like Better Than Bouillon. I actually quite like Better Than Bouillon. And now guys, it is essential that the chicken is completely submerged. I don't want this chicken to be exposed on the top. If the chicken is exposed on the top, that means that the top of it is actually not going to properly poach and cook through. So you need to make sure that there is a generous, generous amount of liquid inside of this pot itself. You don't wanna have any exposed meat. And keeping the skin on will do a really nice job of also protecting the meat as it cooks and stopping it from getting dry and overcooked, okay? So about this many ladles, of chicken stock going on in. Let's see if we can do a little bit more. Again, I'm just doing this until it is completely and utterly covered. We don't want any exposed meat, guys. 
Is that clear? Can I please get a yes chef on that? Please and thank you. Okay, we don't need this ladle for anything else at the moment. I'm gonna go ahead and get rid of it. Okay guys, and now here's the goal. Oh, look how beautiful that is. Every single time that I do like a poached chicken in a stock, it always looks beautiful. Guys, here's the goal. We do not want this to come to a boil. We wanna keep this at a poach. So I'm gonna do a nice medium, medium heat here. We're going to keep an eye on it. I don't wanna see big bubbles. A slight simmer is okay, but we're looking for something that is just under a simmer. Because when you blast something like this with high heat, what's going to happen is the outside of it is going to overcook. We boil, well, we poach, we don't boil. Boil, fuck, I messed, it up. I messed it up. We poach, we don't boil. We poach, we don't boil. Poach, not boil, thank you. I messed it up for a second. I couldn't get it right. So guys, we're just gonna go ahead and put it on to the heat. You can put a lid on it if you want. There is a very specific reason that I'm not keeping a lid on. It's because I wanna have this look nice for the camera. Actually, having a lid on this is pretty ideal because we're not really looking for it to reduce. Uh, but I am, I am doing this for you guys. I'm doing this for, you know, for the people. Um, I do need to actually quickly wipe off the side of my Instant Pot in just a moment, actually. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and quickly wash out my saucepan. Um, I'm going to just go ahead and throw you guys over to the stove just by itself. Um, does anybody have any questions for me in the meantime? I'm gonna just go ahead and wash out the saucepan because we are going to need this bad boy later on. We're gonna need this for the fried shallot component. And so this has all of the stuck uh, vinegar and sugar inside of it still. Just getting that done, getting all that taken care of, guys. Thank you so much for your patience. And then we'll wipe it off because we're going to fill it with oil at some point. But yeah, this is a really good time to ask me any questions whatsoever. It can be about this dish, it can be about something else. Is there salt in the stock? So, really good question, actually. Um, there is salt only in the stock for the chicken because we're actually looking to fully season the chicken, uh, but there is no salt in the base stock itself. Whenever I make big batches of stock, I never, never, never season them. I only flavor them with different aromatics because you don't know what you'll be using it for later on. Okay, I'm just gonna go ahead and take this and wipe this off because, again, I need this nice and dry for later on today. Beautiful. And then we're going to go ahead and move on into the other things. Um, I've been enjoying Korean pork recipes lately. Any knowledge or interest in that area? So Oscar, Korean cooking was one of the first things that I was doing on stream um, in an attempt to get to know it a little bit more. I didn't actually get to do a lot of Korean pork dishes because I don't get to get my hands on a lot of Korean like ribs and stuff, which uh, is like quite often. You'd see like a lot of pork ribs. Um, but I did a lot of like beef and chicken ones. What's a good thing to use if I want to make a stock, but I'm not uh, making a whole chicken like anytime soon? Uh, break down a whole chicken and free some of its parts. Or you could buy chicken legs and use the chicken legs and you could buy chicken thighs and then you can debone it and stuff. Or you can use chicken wings or you can go buy chicken bones from a butcher. Um, or yes, yeah, so a Costco rotisserie chicken carcass. That does work too. Uh, can you tell us what is the difference between a chicken stock and a chicken bone broth? Lovely question. Ooh, Guchu, this is one of my favorite cooking topics. Everybody wants you all to tap in. I want you all to tap in right now. Is everybody listening? This is, this is, this is a heated subject for me. This is something that I have a lot of feelings, a lot of thoughts on. Okay, guess what? Guess what? Bone broth became a purely marketing term. I'm gonna say right now, all that a bone broth is, is an incredibly gelatinous stock. But even then, store-bought bone broth became a marketing thing because it, it came out of wellness culture. It came out of West Coast wellness culture. Because, oh, the gelatin, the collagen is good for you. It's broth. It is broth at the end of the day. So basically, here's what happens. When you make a meat broth out of bones, out of beef bones, out of chicken bones, there is a lot of collagen. The collagen, when heated up until a certain point, becomes gelatin. And then the gelatin becomes water soluble. And so, the less water you have relative to the amount of gelatin that you have, the more gelatinous your stock is going to be. Right? You ever like, eat like a soup dumpling and it's really sticky? You ever have like a tonkotsu, right? Like a tonkotsu ramen, and it's very like sticky. You have like that in your mouth. That's because it's a very gelatinous, very concentrated stock, okay? And so the only difference between a bone broth, technically versus another kind of broth or a different kind of stock, is that it has bones and it has a lot of gelatin in it. That's all. But I would never call it that because as long as it's a chicken stock to me, it's a fairly gelatinous chicken stock, right? It's already, it already has gelatin, right? 
Needs more broth, maybe, chef? No, I don't think so. This is perfect. Okay, guys, guys, I want you to take a look. It's gently beginning to blah, 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 which is exactly what we're looking for. We're not looking for an aggressive boil here, okay? We're not looking for, also my music stopped, excuse me. We're not looking for it to be boiling. We're not looking for it to be a rolling boil. We're just looking for the lightest and the lightest of poaches. Um, as for do we actually need more liquid? That chicken leg is a little bit exposed, but honestly, we'll just flip it around. We'll be turning it as it cooks. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and take a timer and I'm going to set it to, I think like 40 minutes. Um, 40 minutes is going to be ample time for the chicken to get nice and soft. Again, we're not looking to blast this thing with heat, okay? Um, I'm going to go ahead and wash off my knife because it was cutting some other wet stuff, of course. And we want to make sure that I'm keeping my knife nice and clean and free of anything that could end up rusting it. Okay. So, we have a lot of other things that we need to do, guys. Let's go ahead and make, uh, let's do a little bit of a recap session. We're doing goiga bap kai. Goiga bap kai is, of course, a Vietnamese chicken cabbage salad. And so we made the pickled shallots for it. Typically, you'd have pickled onions, but we made some pickled shallots. Uh, we're currently working on poaching the chicken for the salad that will then be shredded. Look at the bubbling. Look how beautiful it is. Look how beautiful the shot is. I'm going to go ahead and put this on a still just so that you guys can see how pretty that is. Okay. Look at that. Gorgeous. Just bubbling away, simmering away, but very, very gently, but we're never, 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 never being aggressive with it. Um, what, what else do we have to do? We have to make the shredded cabbage, we have to make the roasted peanuts, we have to make the crispy shallots, and we also have to make the dressing. So there's a lot that actually needs to be get, uh, that needs to get done at the moment. So, um, we can begin probably with shredding the cabbage, actually, while this is, you know, just going on. I'm just going to, once again, just wipe off the saucepan for when I need it. Lovely. Okay. So, let's go ahead and begin. Let's head back on over to my cutting board. And now guys, as always, whenever you are cutting something, whenever you are chopping something in a kitchen, the first and the most important thing is that you understand uh, where you're going to be putting things once you're done slicing them. And so, for my cabbage, we're going to need a bowl that feels like it's a little bit too big. And I'm going to explain to you why. Cabbage takes up a ridiculous amount of volume when it's sliced because of how much air it has. But as soon as you process it a little bit, as soon as it gets a little bit processed, it ends up breaking down. And so we need a large enough bowl to be able to actually compensate. Uh, I think that might actually just be too big, but no, no, no. I keep making the mistake. I promise you that bowl is not too big at all. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to have this bowl set and ready to go for whenever we need it. Okay, when it actually comes to slicing the cabbage, we're not looking for it to be too thin, we're not looking for it to be too thick, but what we'll be doing is we'll be salting the cabbage. And what does salting the cabbage in advance actually accomplish? By salting the cabbage in advance, this is something that I love doing with cabbage salads, especially if they're not intended to be eaten immediately. When you salt a cabbage salad, when you salt a big collection of cabbage, you release all of that excess liquid. These bad boys are full of liquid and they're desperately waiting to be drained of it. Okay, you wanna help them out. You wanna get rid of all of that excess liquid. So we're going to shred it up, we're going to salt it, and we're going to let it sit with the salt. And then we're going to go ahead and pour out all of the liquid that is released. And that way, when the salad sits in your fridge, it's not going to be in a big puddle of cabbage water. And you don't want cabbage water, at least I would think so. I'm also gonna go ahead and put my cilantro away really quickly. So please bear with me. Just one second, everybody. Okay, so. We're going to go ahead and go on through this. Uh, this is a quarter head of cabbage and I have another half, head, half head of cabbage behind me, excuse me. Um, I'm going to just go ahead guys and we're going to just make nice long slices. We're not chopping, we're slicing, 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 using the full length of my knife as much as possible, okay? And then we're actually going to go ahead and give this thing a little bit of a turn. We're going to slice it down this way as well. Okay, and we never want to go ahead and cut the core out, by the way. The core is going to keep all of these cabbage leaves nice and beautifully intact. Okay, and whenever, by the way, your cutting board feels like it's getting a little bit too full, um, you just want to go ahead and just scoop everything up and put it into that bowl that we've set aside. Chef, is there a reason to uh, chop versus slice? Yes, there is, because if you chop it, if you chop it, uh, you end up uh, sort of cleaving it and your knife exits the cabbage. You see how it slipped out? But by slicing it and using the full length of the knife, the knife ends up staying on nice and beautifully flat and you're able to get a full uh, shred of cabbage without it slipping out of anything. So that's why, it's pretty important. Okay, let's continue to just shred up all of this cabbage, guys. 
And now we're going to go in this way as well. We're not gonna waste any of this. Let's get it all nicely shredded up. And again, we're keeping the quote of it nice and intact. Okay, and let's go ahead and do some of this as well. There we go. And then this quote, I'm going to go ahead and toss that aside. We have no more use for it. And now let's go ahead and repeat with the rest of the cabbage. This is a very nice time, by the way, to ask me any and all questions that you may have, or just give me something to talk about because we have to repeat this two more times with the rest of the cabbage. Okay. And again, this is why you want a really large bowl. I promise you all this cabbage is going to shrink in volume, but you need a bowl to first compensate for the sheer volume of all that raw cabbage. Okay. Let's go ahead and move on into the next one. And as usual, guys, once again, I'm just going to be cutting this through the core. The core of the cabbage is what keeps it intact as we slice into the bad boy. Okay. Putting the rest of that behind me. Putting it behind me, putting it into the past. Okay, and let's go ahead and just take a little peek on the chicken. Um, every five minutes or so, I'm just going to give everything a nice little flip. I'm going to give everything a nice little rotation. Uh, and the reason for that is because even if it is fully submerged, we do risk not evenly cooking the chicken. And so every five minutes, I'm just going to go through every single thigh, every single leg, just make sure nothing is stuck to the bottom or anything. And we're not really looking to pierce the skin either. We're not going to be eating the skin, but the skin is quite functional in making sure that, um, you know, nothing is like sort of exposed completely to just the boiling water, right? Yeah, so that is a little bit exposed at the moment. That's okay. That'll be okay, I think. As long as it's not significantly exposed, then it'll be fine. Um, hi, Banner. Lovely to have you. Chef, I saw you post about beans and chili uh, without. Is there a difference? Natalie, are you? You're making me discourse. I feel like... <laughs> Natalie, you are bringing these up in bad faith. You are trying to get me to start a fight here. Okay, and once again, just whenever the cutting board does fill up, we're going to scoop it out. I don't actually believe that there is a single living Texan that has ever genuinely in good faith argued the position that there is no beans and chili. I don't believe that they exist. I actually genuinely do not believe that they exist. Because every single Texan, it's uh, it feels performative. Right? It feels as performative as Italians arguing about whether or not it's called sauce or gravy. They're not actually genuinely arguing this position. They don't actually have genuine sincere feelings on the subject. They're being argumentative and contrarian. Muna, watch it. And so, that is what specifically bothers me about it. I'm not opposed to people that actually genuinely have an opinion on the subject matter, right? That say, oh, beans don't belong in chili or anything. Right? But I have yet to meet somebody that genuinely, in good faith, has ever argued that position to me. Okay? So that's my problem. We don't use them. They don't belong. Right? It doesn't make any sense. It does not make any sense. It is just faulty. It is faulty and it is circular logic. The beans in a chili are essential to the viscosity of a chili because the beans, the cooking liquid, all the starches from the cooking liquid is what actually blends and brings a chili together beautifully. Without it, without the beans, you have a watery mess of a chili. Oh, and oh my God, oh my God, you know what bothers me? You know how many times you go to a restaurant and the chilies just actually just end up sucking and it's just like tough ground meat? Right? In like liquid, in like tomato liquid, and there's no real taste of chilies, it just tastes like tomatoes. It tastes like tomatoes watered in like, you know, balls of ground beef. It bothers me so much. A beautiful chili is supposed to be creamy from the viscous, delicious bean liquid. The meat is supposed to have been cooked long enough that it falls apart, and it needs to have the taste of whole dried chilies. Not chili powder, but you want to have chipotles. Oh my god, I am going on a bit of a detour. That has nothing to do with what we're doing today but you want to have chipotles, you want to have guajillos, you want to have a beautiful, beautiful variety of chilies because that is what a chili is about. A chili at the end of the day should be about chilies and yet it is lost and people just drown it in tomatoes. Tomatoes are not the main component. It bothers me. Okay, cabbage quote out of here, you dunskies. Let's go ahead and get the rest of the sliced cabbage inside and we have one more quarter of cabbage to get through. By the way, remember how I said you want to have a bowl that's slightly too big? Look how much it's paying off. That's just half a head of cabbage and it's already filling up so much. 
okay? So again, my chicken, it's gently, gently poaching. It's gently, gently going right now. I'm going to just flip this one around just to hopefully see if I can get it submerged a little bit more at least, but it should be okay. Again, we're going to let that cook in total for about like 40 minutes to an hour, okay? It's going to maybe take longer because it is bone in. Okay, guys, one last cabbage to go through. But yeah, that is my, I have a lot of strong opinions on chili. And in fact, I think I'm one of the only people alive that's ever genuinely argued on behalf of chili. I think almost everybody else that does it, they, they don't actually have a real opinion on this. You know what it reminds me of? This is a recent event for me. I've had another argument with people about like, oh, are hot dogs, tacos, or a sandwich? Not a single person arguing that actually believes either of their points. They're just making conversation and they think they're being cute. And it bothers me. It does sincerely bother me. Because they're not being cute. They just, it's just meaningless conversation. It's nothing. Anyhow, slicing up all the cabbage. Almost getting done with it. Is it a sandwich or is it a taco? It's, you don't care. You're not arguing this, right? It's just a bit. Okay. I have a lot of strong opinions on the subject. I don't know if you guys could tell. Um, let's see, what else can we shred up here? Let's go through this. Tacos are wraps. I'm so upset. I can't even begin to express my anger, audio movie. Uh, Doug, how did you learn so much about food just by being interested? Have I, have I had teachers? I've had a couple of cooking classes in the past, but uh, the reason I've learned so much is because I've been cooking since I was seven years old. And now I am the, you know, age of 21. So I've been obsessed with cooking. Cooking has been my hyper fixation. It's been my interest for 14 years. Um, and... You know, I'm, I'm mostly self-taught, right? I consumed a lot of the information and knowledge around me, especially in the YouTube food space. And over time, I've realized how mediocre so much of the existing cooking uh, instruction actually is. It's just not good. And so what I want to do is I want to change the way that people cook at home. Daski, thank you for stopping by. Thank you for being here. I really, really appreciate you. Okay, so guess what? We have officially processed up all of the cabbage, guys. And now it's time to do the essential part, guys. It is time to now salt the cabbage. So why are we salting the cabbage? We salt it in advance because the cabbage is going to lose a lot of volume this way and it's going to season it. But most importantly, we're going to get rid of all of that bland cabbage water that is on the inside. They're full, they're overly saturated with water. And so by salting it in advance and tossing it around and letting it sit, we are able to then drain out that liquid. The process is the same for making kimchi, for making sauerkraut, right? Or just for making a uh, cabbage salad, right? Because my goal is I do want this cabbage to uh, be in my fridge. I want this salad to be just in the fridge, right? And if you season it up beautifully, it's going to be amazing when you eat it now, but it's not going to be so amazing later on. Okay, four big pinches. Guys, a lot of the salt is actually going to dissipate into the release water, so you want your cabbage to be slightly too salty. I want you to uh, toss this cabbage around, right? We can press it, we can crush it, we can do all these things to it, but really all you have to do is just toss it around a bit, Toss that salt around, and if you think that you've not mixed it, if you think you've mixed it enough, you actually haven't. Uh, how long do we let it sit before ringing, asks Serena Chessel. So Serena, it's good to see you. Um, we let it sit for maybe like 30 minutes or so. 30, 40 minutes. At least 20. I don't think it's that necessarily past it. Okay, so now that you've tossed it around aggressively, right? You've really, really broken it up. All right, let's go ahead and taste it. That's it. Slightly too salty. That's exactly what I'm looking for. Again, you do not want this to be under salted. All of that salt is going to dissipate into the actual release liquid from the cabbage itself. Okay, so now I can just go ahead and take this and yet again, just set this bad boy behind me. So everybody, we're making goiga bap kai today. Um, for those of you that may not know, goiga bap kai is a Vietnamese chicken cabbage salad. And this is to me the epitome of home cooking. I'm doing a dish that I've never actually done before. But the reason that I'm doing this today is because uh, I had a lot of leftovers in my fridge to get rid of. I had some leftover chicken, I had leftover cabbage, I had leftover lime, leftover cilantro, leftover chilies. And so typically you look at these ingredients and you think of, you know, okay, I wanna make Mexican food now. But the beauty of cuisine and the beauty of culture and the beauty of food is that there is so much different interaction and there is so much different similarities, at least in ingredients uh, between different cuisines. 
And so what I'm trying to show off and what I'm trying to practice for myself is how do I not pigeonhole myself creativity, uh, creatively? How do I not just do, you know, the same Mexican dishes over and over again, right? How, with what I have at home, do I go ahead and turn this into, you know, this Vietnamese dish and it seems to fit in perfectly. Um, so at the moment for the Goi Gai Kai, we have the poaching chicken guys. It's not boiling. It's not even simmering. It's gently, slowly poaching in hot liquid. And my delicious homemade chicken stock alongside scallions, alongside ginger, alongside garlic, and a lot of salt. Also, thank you so much for the hundred bits. Thank you, thank you. Um, it's gently, gently poaching. We do not boil in this household. Chat, do we boil meat? I want to hear the no chef from everybody watching. Please and thank you. We do not boil because the outside of the meat will get overcooked by the time that the inside is done. By making sure that the temperature is nice and low and the skin on the chicken itself. This is not a boiled chicken, guys. This is a poached chicken. And yes, contrary to what TikTok may tell you, they are very different. Okay, so we're just going ahead and we're flipping all of these around just to ensure that everything is evenly and consistently cooking. Excellent. Okay, it's going to be beautiful. It's going to shred up really, really nicely. Also, hello, Kit Nina. Welcome on, and it's lovely to have you. Okay, and then I'm going to put the rest of my homemade delicious chicken stock away because I have no more use for this at the moment. I'm just going to go ahead and set that pot behind me somewhere. Okay, so what else did we accomplish? We have made some quick pickled shallots, and we're about to go ahead and put those into the fridge. Let me go ahead and show that off to you guys right now. So, why am I using quick pickled shallots? Well, in this uh, dish, in the salad, traditionally, you have quick pickled onions, right? You have some pickled red onions. I did not do onions because I already bought a sack of shallots with which to make crispy shallots with. And so, sitting in here is my beautiful collection of chilies, my suganos, my shallots, some cilantro, um, some coriander seeds, and some garlic. And it smells incredible at the moment. It smells like those chilies. And the paper towel is over it to keep it all submerged. The paper towel soaks up some of that, like, uh, brine that we made, okay? And then it's keeping all of it nicely covered. And so now, because this has cooled down enough and it's no longer boiling, I'm going to go ahead and just take this and throw this on into the fridge and then this will be added towards the end of the salad, guys. Okay, lovely. So let's think about what else that we actually need to do. Um, and the other thing that we've accomplished is we've salted the cabbage. We salt the cabbage in advance so that we get rid of all the excess cabbage liquid. We drain it off and then we actually build the salad itself. So here's the other components that need to get done at the moment. First thing I'm gonna do, once again, I'm just gonna rinse off my knife. Uh, we need to make the crispy shallot component. We need to make the roasted peanut component. We make the crispy shallots, we make the roasted peanuts, and we also need to make the dressing. And we also have to go ahead and slice up everything else that we need for the salad. We're gonna have coriander, we're going to go ahead and have um, some scallions. It's going to be amazing, it's gonna be aromatic, it's a very vegetable for the dish today, right? Um, I think let's just go ahead and get started uh, with my roasted peanuts. Uh, there's a lot of ways to do roasted peanuts, guys. Um, you know, you could theoretically just do them in a pan, in a wok. You could do wok fried roasted peanuts, especially if you have uh, like the red peanuts. Um, in this case, I'm actually just going to be doing oven roasted peanuts. I haven't actually done this in quite some time, so I do hope it comes out well. So I'm taking my oven and I'm setting it to 350 degrees. 350 degrees going on now, and I have my sheet tray ready to go. So all I'm going to do, guys, I have a nice bag of raw peanuts here, right? Not cooked, of course, because we are going to cook them ourselves. And um, let's go ahead and figure out what the station actually looks like. Um, one concern that I have is when I do shell the peanuts, they might have some of the peanut shells still stuck on the outside of it. And so we might want to go ahead and put them over the strainer. But you know what? Let's just cross that bridge when we come to it. Um, we're only going to really need like half a cup of, uh, you know, shelled peanuts here. So I'm going to show you the way that I do it, or at least the way that I used to do it. Um, I, again, I haven't shelled a peanut in a while. I take it and I sort of fit my thumb inside and I use my thumb like a nutcracker. And then I go ahead and I make sure to open this over a separate vessel, right? Like over my waste bowl and not my actual, you know, food bowl because we don't want any of that nasty stuff on it. Okay, we take it and we go ahead and we just open all of it up. Beautiful. And we want to go ahead and get rid of the husk as well, right? Because sometimes it'll have a husk on it. So it just peels off just like so. Although, it does seem a little bit tedious and annoying, and so I don't think I'm that crazy about doing that at the moment, actually. Okay, so uh, let's see how long this is actually going to take for me to go through all of these peanuts, guys. Uh, once again, if you have any questions, if you have any comments, if you have any concerns, anything that you want to say to me in the moment, this is the best time to do so. And then again, I'm also just going to go ahead and crack them in half um, because we want halved peanuts for them to go into the oven. 
Okay, we don't want whole peanuts. Uh, when you crack them like that, they do just cook up a little bit easier. They do cook up a little bit more evenly. Is there a better way to do this than I'm doing it? Actually getting these two, some of these to like come apart is kind of a challenge. Yeah, like that one's just not coming off. Okay, I'm definitely going too slowly through this as well. I could be doing this in like a two-step process. Again, it's been a really, really long time since I've had to, you know, do this with some, with some peanuts. Um, so I do apologize for how long I am taking with this. Okay, there we go. That's split in half now. Nice. Well, guys, look how much uh, peanuts we got with that much effort. Mmm, my favorite. Uh, for general cooking, soy or canola oil. Uh, to read in the chest, my answer is actually peanut oil in that case. Typically, though, canola oil. Um, but I do love peanut oil. I think peanut oil has the best taste for me compared to the other, um, you know, neutral frying oils. Okay. You know, I probably should have looked up a better way to do this. Uh, again, this is not something that I've done in a long time, so I apologize for how long this is taking. I just know I actually had to crack them in half. As for peeling them, that's outside of my pay grade. Cracking it, opening it, awesome. Get the husk off, all of that works out great. Uh, Tarina, it's all right. I'd prefer not to talk about that, because that was yesterday. But we're just going through all of these, making it happen. Lovely, and keep it going. Um, yeah, once again, guys, uh, any questions whatsoever, this would be a beautiful time to ask me, uh, because we were just going through the process of shelling up all my nuts. <laughs> Don't worry about it. And then after this, we're going to make the crispy shallots. We're going to have to do the dressing. We have to slice up the coriander. Chef, what goes into roasted peanuts? Beautiful question. Um, all that we're going to do is we're going to throw this into a 350 degree oven for around 10 to 12 minutes um, is the method that I've sort of stumbled upon as being quite a bit better. Um, ooh, that husk is thick. Why is this husk so thick? Oh my God, I can't get that one out. Whoa, I don't know what's going on inside of this guy. Yeah, this one's just decayed. I'm not gonna go ahead and use that. Um, but yeah, we're gonna go ahead and throw it into a 350 degree oven and then every five minutes or so, uh, we're going to just uh, you know give it a little turn, a little flip. So the thing about nuts that you do need to keep in mind is even if it just looks, even if it doesn't look burnt, it can really, really easily begin to taste burnt. Uh, I forgot about the reasons why this is the case, but there's like a couple of things that I have in mind, um, especially like nuts, with like even what looks like a very pleasant, like dark brown on the outside, by that point, they do really taste acrid and burnt and bitter. Are peanuts legumes? Uh, ben, I don't even know what a legume is, I'm gonna be honest with you. Yeah, I don't really know what a legume is fully. Um, also, I don't think this is that like essential of a component to the salad because this is just purely going to be a topping for us today. Right? We're just throwing this into the oven and we're going to chop it up after it roasts. Um, you could probably also just use already roasted peanuts. I'm confident that you don't have to roast these yourself. Um, I just wanted to see, is there a tangible difference in like a freshly like roasted home peanut or is it something that's just worth already buying roasted? Because typically a lot of like the toasty, a lot of the aromatic flavors, um, you know, a lot of the toasty, a lot of the aromatic flavors, those do tend to sort of dissipate when they're pre-roasted, when they're pre-toasted. And so, I'm gonna be putting that to the test today. Again, this is not something that I typically do. I should have probably looked in a little bit further as to what would be the optimal way to actually peel these things. Are these actually unroasted? Yes, that was a raw peanut. That was incredibly unpleasant. Ah, they taste almost grassy. Raw peanuts, they have almost like a grassiness to it and they taste like wet on the inside. And so by also uh, making sure that they're going, uh, they're being like cut in half, we do make sure that they thoroughly cook through on the inside. Yeah, yeah. Don't love raw peanuts. Some, um, some nuts are okay raw. This is not one for me though. Okay, and we're just going through all of these guys. Again, I apologize for how tedious of a process that this actually is. In fact, we could probably just do, you guys could probably just watch the stove while I peel the peanuts. What do you think? Is this a better angle? Is this a better shot? Do you guys prefer this? So you guys can actually just watch that as that's unfolding, as that's happening. Although my cameras could definitely be positioned a little bit better in the future, guys. It's definitely not optimal. Ugh, come on, buddy, open up. Yeah, this one, not opening up that easily. What's my favorite nut for eating just by itself? Pretty basic, but I'm gonna say pistachios. I love pistachios to death. 
was like easily my favorite. Okay guys, the chicken, I'm gonna go ahead and take the legs once again and we're going to just keep on flipping them. I wanna keep on flipping them to ensure that they cook through nice and evenly on the inside. And now we're starting to see like the water, um, you know, boil off a little bit. It's starting to get, look a little bit dry in there. I'm just going to go in with like a nice cup of hot water for my sink. Although you could also just use more chicken stock if you would like. But I, if you're doing this at home, what I'd really like you to do is, I would really, really like you to uh, not do this without a lid. A lid would actually stop this evaporation. The reason why I'm doing this without a lid um, is because I wanted to show you all as it's going. But yeah, I do love pistachios. Yeah, those are really good. Okay. Oh, I should have gotten already shelled ones. Ask my mom to pick some up and she, these were the only ones you could find. Okay, so the husk on this guy, it's interesting. They're like really dried off on the outside. But then the peanut, I open it up, it looks okay inside. There you go. Chat, does anybody have any recommendations for the better way that I can do this? There's not a lot of things that I actually admit that I'm not amazing on, uh, but definitely shelling nuts. That is becoming one of my, you know, things I don't think I do that well. Okay. Just continuing to peel it all up. Hulk out. Thank you, Tarina. Incredible advice. I will be sure to employ that next time. Lightly bash them in between some tea towels. Are you talking about like um, once we take them out of the husk? Or are you talking about like once we're like as they're in the husk? Although guys, we only really need half a cup of peanuts for today. It's not a lot. We just need some to be able to top off the salad with. And the rest I'm just gonna go put back in the fridge. Oh, by the way, as a nice little uh, piece of advice, I really do recommend keeping your nuts in the fridge. Also, hi, Glow Angel, big fan. Hello, lovely to have you. So guys, going through all these peanuts, pop, pop, out of the pod, out they all go. Uh, nuts need to be cold, yeah, so Moonha, there's a reason for this. Uh, I often find that, so, uh, there is a very important process here called rancidification. When something goes rancid, that doesn't actually mean it's become unsafe to eat. But a lot of the things that give uh, specifically spices and nuts its taste, uh, they do a little something called rancidify. They turn rancid. And so with nuts specifically, um, because they are in a warmer environment, they undergo that process a little bit faster and they take on, they lose some flavor. Also, whoa, Beetle Moses, thank you so much for the raid. Welcome, welcome. How'd you find the show? Are you guys, uh, is this another cooking show? Is this another cooking stream? Well, I'll tell you what I'm doing in a second, actually, once I'm done with this peanut. Okay, so guys, today we're doing a Vietnamese chicken salad. We're doing a little something called uh, goi ga bap kai. And the reason why I'm doing goi, bap, uh, goi ga bap kai is because everything that I do here, everything that I do on the show, um, is I teach you how to cook at home. So everybody that just came in, I wanna hear a nice resounding yes chef to make sure that you're all listening. Okay, lovely. So, um, guys, this is goi ga bap kai. This is a Vietnamese chicken cabbage salad. Why am I doing this dish? Everything that I do here on the show is home cooking at the end of the day. So for today, I had cabbage in my fridge. I had limes, I had serranos, I had uh, some chicken as well. And I normally get pigeonholed into doing a lot of different Mexican dishes. And so I thought about it and I was like, okay, there's a really, really beautiful intersection between uh, the ingredients that you would often find in Mexican cooking and the ingredients that you would find in Vietnamese cooking, right? And so that's so we're making a goi ga uh, bap kai. And so in my delicious homemade chicken stock, my chicken is gently poaching. It's not boiling. It's gently poaching with some ginger, with some scallions, uh, with some garlic. Okay, we're going ahead and we're shelling up some nuts as well. Some fresh peanuts, we're going to make some freshly roasted peanuts. We made some pickled shallots as well. And then we have all of this cabbage here sitting with some salt to go ahead and get rid of any and all excess moisture. And so I'm just going to go ahead and move the cabbage around. You can see how like wet and limp the cabbage has become. I always pre-salt my cabbage salads so I can then get rid of all of that excess liquid, guys. Okay. Okay, so we're just going to do a couple more. Again, I apologize for how long it's taking, um, but such is the nature of, you know, such is the nature of peanuts, All right? So a couple more to go, and then we'll be okay, I'm sure. So crack it, open it. I could also just be moving in general faster because I feel like I was moving pretty slowly through the entirety of this process. Crack it open, shell it, lovely. It's okay if it has the husk. I'm not going to go through and rub it in between my hands to get rid of all of that peanut husk, right? We're just looking to get rid of most of it, of course. Okay, open it up, lovely. 
go ahead and just make sure that it's cracked in half. That's just going to ensure that it nicely and evenly goes. Um, also guys, once again, as a heads up, you can really, really easily over, um, you know, overcook your nuts. When it comes to nuts and when it comes to actual dry heat cooking methods, like frying them or roasting them, even if they look nice and golden brown on the outside, they actually do burn quite easily. They taste really burnt. Also, two dads kissing. Thank you so much for the gift and sub. Thank you, thank you. Very sweet today. Thank you for inspiring the raid to this channel. Ooh, I lost one of my nuts. Come back, buddy. Okay. At some point, I'm gonna do like three more of these and then I'm going to call it here because I don't think this is particularly interesting and I don't have a faster way to do this. Um, so after this, I'm going to look up what is the optimal way of actually shelling and uh, having peanuts and if there's a good way of getting rid of the husk as well. That might also be quite nice. I have taken pre-shelled peanuts for granted. Oh, that one is missing a nut over there. That's okay, some people are missing one of the nuts. It happens to the best of us, I suppose. And we're taking it and we're cracking it in half. Lovely. Okay. And one last one, and then I'm gonna call it here. Should alliums be refrigerated? Really good questions in Ultra. Um, in regards to my onions and garlic and my shallots, I never refrigerate them. But my leeks and my scallions, I do keep them refrigerated. Um, and I'm not actually sure as to, uh, as to the reasoning for that. I definitely find that scallions, they do go bad outside of a fridge, right? Can't get over the chef's new hairdo. Well, I'm glad you like it. Glad you're a fan. Okay, guys, one last one. Going on in. Uh, soy oil on, you can use it like canola oil, asks Serena Chess. Um, I have not really cooked with soybean oil like that. I mean, I suppose so. You know who'd be a friend, Serena, in this case? Google, because I really, really do prefer my other kinds of oil. Okay, this is roughly half a cup of peanuts. I'm going to go ahead and tie up this sack and throw it into the fridge. Yeah, if it's refrigerated in the store, you can refrigerate it at home, but it also like depends. Like for example, like nuts are refrigerated in the store. Oh yeah, anytime Twitch, like you can't do like .jpeg in the chat because then Twitch does actually interpret it as a link. Okay, I have some like salt here and stuff it looks like. My cutting board. Okay guys, so all we're going to do for the salted, uh, for the roasted peanuts, excuse me. We're going to hit them with a little bit of salt after. Um, all I'm doing is I'm just going to make sure that I have a nice sheet tray. I'm gonna line it with foil just to make my cleanup a little bit easier later on. And then we're going to check on it after uh, three minutes or so and give it like a nice little shake. Right, so 350 degrees, we're going to be baking this off now. Um, in total, it should take maybe like 10 to 12 minutes or so. And then we'll give them a little flip skis. Does anybody have any questions? So I'm actually looking, you see all of like this dust? I'm feeling like I wanna strain that out because it is just gonna end up burning in the oven. So I do have like the slightly wider strainer. So I'm going to, you know what guys? Yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna strain this off first. I'm going to go ahead and just get all of that inside and just shake off all of those like little tiny bits just to make sure that it doesn't burn in the oven. And I don't know how necessary of a step this is. Again, I haven't done this in a while. I've just definitely, I've made roasted peanuts in the past where I felt like uh, they did end up burning a little bit as a result. Is foil better than parchment? So really good question. Um, why do we use parchment sometimes and not foil and vice versa? So parchment would actually be just fine for this. Um, the reason why you would sometimes not use parchment is because the oven temperature would be a little bit too hot. Okay, but um, because we're actually doing it 350, it would have been probably a little less wasteful of me to use uh, parchment in this case. But it actually does make no difference at this level of cooking. Um, another beauty of parchment is that it does have like some like natural like non-stickness to it. Like cookies don't want to really stick to parchment. Um, that has to do with heat conductivity and browning actually. Um, okay, how do I cook peanuts without eating them all immediately? Well, because these are unroasted peanuts and I think raw peanuts taste kind of wet. So guys, into a 350 degree oven, I'm going to put them in there for, you know, in total like 10 to 12 minutes and every so often I'll be flipping them and tossing them. So let's head back to the stove. Okay, my chicken is continuing to poach along beautifully. It's poaching a little too aggressively, I would say. So I'm just going to go ahead and take it and I'm gonna go ahead and flip it all over to ensure that it's all evenly cooking as it goes. It's in my delicious homemade chicken stock. It's with the garlic, with the scallion ends, with the ginger. So you know it's gonna be aromatic, it's gonna be delicious. And by poaching it and not boiling it, we do protect it from being overcooked on the outside. Guys, this is not your Midwestern white moms. If you're white and from the Midwest, this is for you. This is not your Midwestern white moms chicken salad. 
She did not just take chicken breasts and put them and plunge them directly into hot boiling water. And the outside of it is so dry and overcooked. Ugh, and it's a mess and it's a disaster. This is not your white Midwestern mom's chicken salad. This is a gently, beautifully aromatic poached chicken to then make into this Vietnamese chicken salad. Okay? You can cook chicken in liquid. You can gently poach it if you know what you're doing. And by not boiling it, by not killing it with heat, by not killing it with fire, you make sure that the outside isn't overcooked, that the outside doesn't actually become dry. Water can be, water in a kitchen is so fascinating because it can be both the most gentle force in terms of like abrasion and cooking with this, but then it can also be one of the most aggressive ones when you're actually boiling. A lot of cooking is, you know, a lot of what it actually means to cook at home is to understand water, it's to understand moisture, it's to understand how it conducts heat and the kinds of things that it does. Right? And so we're gently, gently, gently letting it go, guys. Nice and patient. Okay. So we have to go ahead and think about all the other components that we need. The peanuts are currently toasting. The shallots are uh, currently pickling, so those are basically ready to go. The cabbage is sitting with the salt, the stock is made, the chicken is poaching. We have two more things left to do. We have to make crispy, beautifully fried shallots, and then we also have to go ahead and make the dressing. That is where the magic of Vietnamese cooking is, and it's going to be amazing. We're going to be doing this dressing with, oops, excuse me, with lime juice with some serranos instead of a Thai bird's eye because I had serranos. We're going to be doing it with garlic, with ginger, and of course, plenty of fish sauce because you cannot have Vietnamese food without fish sauce. It has that funk, it has that oomph. If you had fish sauce by itself, it's not the best. But when you have all these other powerful ingredients with it, it's incredible. If I had to choose between water bedding and fire bending, what's the most useful for cooking? Munha? Oh, I guess fire bending, right? Because there will always be water, but there will not always be fire. So I guess fire bending. So, let's go ahead and begin the process of doing the shallots. So, Let's talk about this as a component actually, and let's talk about why I might not necessarily be the, uh, the happiest doing this. So here's the thing. When it comes to something like crispy fried shallots as a condiment, as a topping, this is something that you see in a lot of different households, but they're already purchased, they're already bought. Um, you can already theoretically just buy these as it is, okay? Um, I did not do that. I'm just going to be frying these shallots from scratch. I might end up hating this process. And why would I end up hating this process? I might end up hating it because I think deep frying at home is a massive, massive headache. So we're going to be doing it in a saucepan. We'll be doing it in a good volume of oil, right? It's gonna be like a deep fried shallot. And we'll see if we actually get the product that I would like. If I deem that this is too much effort and it's not really worth it, um, ultimately I'm just going to land on suggesting that you buy pre-fried crispy shallots, which you can buy at any you know Asian grocery store. So I'm going to go ahead and just cut off the heads of all of my lovely little shallots. I love shallots, but man, cooking them is gonna be annoying today. So we'll see. We'll just have to see how that goes. Also, if you have a mandolin, uh, this would be ideal because we're looking for paper thin shallots. We're looking for like a 16th of an inch, I believe. Okay, for like these really nice crispy fried shallots. Because it's not supposed to be like a sauteed onion. It's supposed to be a fried shallot. You need the shallot to be so thin that it basically loses all of its moisture and then it's able to crisp up from the inside. Okay. What if the nearest Asian grocery store is two or three hours away from you? Uh, uh, make your own crispy shallots. <laughs> I don't know if I have much better advice than that. So I'm not gonna cut these in half or anything. I'm just going to go ahead and peel them directly. We're going to go ahead and get rid of all the skin. Uh, two dads kissing, you're asking me excellent questions about the power systems within Avatar. And the answer is probably not. I don't think that's how water bending actually works. But yes, all of these magical systems are innately flawed. You can say that. Okay, a uh, little time check. Uh, the peanuts, I believe, have been baking for approximately four minutes. I'm going to go ahead and just pull them out. I'm gonna give them a good old shake because uh, we wanna make sure that they're cooking nice and even. If you have a convection oven, um, they would probably do a better job of evenly cooking the peanuts themselves but I'm just going to go ahead and just take out my nuts. Not on Twitch though. I'm gonna go ahead and take them out. And I'm just gonna give them a good old shake, guys. A nice little shake, a nice little flip, just like this, right? And make sure that they're all nicely and evenly distributed. They look a little bit wet on the outside. I'm gonna go ahead and just throw that back on in. And again, we're looking for like a total of like 10 to 12 minutes of total cook time. Oh, I, I, uh, I heard about it. Are you talking about the stuff at Hoyt? Audio movie theme? Okay, once again, I'm just going through, I'm peeling up all of my lovely little shallots. 
Okay, there you go. One last one left. And that timer, by the way, that, that little beep, that is for the chicken. I think I'm actually going to put, uh, put the chicken on a little bit longer. So why do we need to actually cook the chicken this long? Well, we have chicken legs and we have chicken thighs. At around 175 degrees internal temperature, um, you know, chicken legs and chicken thighs, they have a lot of collagen. Right? They have a lot of collagen, they have a lot of connective tissue, they have a lot of really, really tough parts. At 175 degrees, the collagen becomes gelatin, okay? And when it becomes gelatin, um, it becomes nice and soft and tender. If you're cooking a chicken breast, you're really only shooting for 155 degrees internal. I'm not actually going to probe, you know, the inner temperature of my chicken legs and chicken thighs, but that's what we're roughly shooting for if you wanted to, okay? So, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and set the timer on for another, you know, 10 minutes at the very least, and I'm gonna give them a good old flip. And then in around two minutes, I'm gonna go ahead and also agitate my peanuts a little bit. And just give that all a nice little flip, guys, because again, we're just making sure that it's cooking nice and gently and evenly. Do I uh, fight with my feet because my hands are through cooking like Sanji? Sanji used to be my favorite character in One Piece. Sanji used to be my favorite, and then all the characters in One Piece post time skip experienced the worst flanderization imaginable. They all just became, Sanji used to be so passionate, he used to have so many dreams about cooking, and now he's just a predator. He's just a menace to women now. It is unbelievable. Actually, guys, I'm thinking maybe I want to get a slightly smaller knife. Hmm. No, no, we'll do this with a chef's knife. Okay, guys, if you have a mandolin, not the instrument, I do mean the cooking tool, this would be the time to use it. I'm looking for paper thin sliced shallots, a 16th of an inch. Okay, you wanna be able to essentially see through these shallots. Okay? Chef, do I hate watch One Piece? Um, at one point I did, but One Piece started getting good again. So it's no longer a hate watch. It's back to a love watch, kind of. I have, I've been watching One Piece half, longer than half the time I've been alive. I've been watching One Piece for over half of my life. Cause I'm 21. I started when I was nine, I think. Don't watch One Piece, read it. I've been watching One Piece since I was nine. I will continue to watch One Piece. Yeah, some of these shallots are a little bit too thick. Um, that's okay. You know, it's a little clunky to do this kind of like super precision cutting with a knife. So all I'm going to do is I'm just gonna go nice and slow throughout all of them. I'm going to continue watching it. It's just gonna happen as many problems with the show as I may have. Okay, there you go. That's that. Let's go ahead, ooh, is that like some more like peanut dust still? I see. Okay, and I'm gonna just go ahead and have a separate plate on which I'll be ready to transfer over all of it too. Okay guys, uh, really quickly, so sorry. Oh, whole cake was so bad. Whole cake was one of the worst arcs I've ever seen in any TV show of my life. Um, we're going to cook it for about three more minutes, these peanuts that is. We're just looking for them to get nice and toasted and roasted, okay, right? You can hear the sounds changing a little bit, right? Because we're cooking out some of the moisture, they're getting a little bit drier. We wanna go ahead and put that back in for around five more minutes and then we'll call it a day with them. Five to three more minutes, something like that. I'm sure it'll be okay. As long as it's not like super dark brown on the outside. Okay, back to this. Fishman Island was worse. I like Fishman Island purely because of the world building. Okay, but that's enough One Piece, guys. This is a cooking show, not a... Well, actually, you can talk about it with this. So, I'm going really, really thin. Really thin slices, guys. Super thin. As thin as I can physically muster. My crispy shouts might, uh, might not actually come out perfectly because uh, they're not being sliced as thin as they need to be. Your shallots do need to be really, really thinly sliced for something like this, okay? It is important. Okay, okay. And by the way, you wanna make sure that you're also not slicing these too far in advance. And the reason why you don't wanna slice these too far in advance is because the longer that you actually slice it and you let it sit by itself, the more water it's actually going to end up leaching out. And all that water is going to just splash as soon as it hits the oil. Guys, actually, everybody uh, tap in right now. I wanna hear a nice resounding guest chef. Is everybody listening? I'm going to talk to you about a concept called destructive versus non-destructive prep. Non-destructive prep, in my mind, is something like, you know, you're washing herbs and you're putting them in a container to use later. Destructive prep is something like slicing onions, slicing these shallots. When you slice these in advance, 
what happens is that the longer they sit out, the more water ends up getting pushed out out of the shallots. They basically end up becoming mushy, they become softer, the edges become a lot less sharp, and then it becomes wet and covered in its own release liquid. I will never pre-chop onions. I will never pre-slice shallots. So I'm doing this just before I have to actually fry them. Okay, what I mean by just before, I'm not doing this like an hour in advance, right? I'm doing this 20, 30 minutes in advance. I'm not doing this a day in advance. I'm not doing this half a day in advance, right? I think it's really, really important. Also, I think my chicken is cooking too aggressively. Thank you for the reminder. And I'm gonna go ahead and pull out the uh, nuts in just a moment. Okay guys, we have all of these shallots. Let's go ahead and just scoop it all up. I am contemplating whether or not I wanna fry the rest of it. Um, these are some big shallots I have to say today. Let's just go ahead and slice up this one and call it a day. Although this does need to be peeled up again because take a look at that. We don't want anything to do with that. But yeah guys, destructive versus non-destructive prep. Some things in the kitchen can be done in advance. Something like pre-chopping my aromatics, if they're intended to be fried or sauteed, I will never do that because that way, they will never actually properly get like a good color on it. Um, I've seen cooks slice shallots more finely than onions. The two shallots, do shallots have a unique property that requires a more fine slice? Amazing question, two dads cooking. Let me tell you why, or the two dads kissing. Although two dads cooking is probably appropriate for you. Um, the reason why you slice them thinly and small is because alliums melt in. The reason you want to slice shallots paper thin into something like a saute or like a sauce is because it, melt in, it melts in and it provides a sweetness like an aromatic. But you don't want to bite into pieces of shallot. When you bite into pieces of it and you feel the sweetness of it, that's actually less of its sugar and less of its aromatic qualities that end up going into the rest of the dish. If I could cook any imaginary meal from an anime or something, what would it be? I don't think I have an answer to that question. Okay guys, guess what? My peanuts are officially done. I'm gonna go ahead and just pop those bad boys out of the oven. They've done a good job for us today. Everybody, please say thank you to the peanuts. They have been roasting and they're now ready to come out. And we're gonna go ahead and just let them gently cool off. Beautiful. Oh yeah, there we go. That smells like a nice, beautifully toasted peanut. Nice, and then uh, we'll taste it. We'll taste it with some salt and see how it actually ended up coming out. I'm taking my time today. We're being nice and gentle. I'm gonna flip my chicken over one last time. Again, we're just looking for this to be so tender that we're able to shred it up, but we don't want it to be completely falling off the bone, right? Because then we start losing some of the meat and all that poaching liquid. All right, there we go. Those are my lovely peanuts, guys. Thank you, Moonha. I appreciate it. But yeah, those peanuts are done, guys. The shallots, we're going to go ahead and finish them. I'm sorry for how long I'm taking with this step, but we really do need to ensure that they're nice and thin. So paper, paper, paper thin. Paper, paper thin. There you go, that's what I'm looking for. Chrisé, please don't say that. Please don't say that to me. Also, welcome on in. Hello, hello. I hope you're having a beautiful day today. Guys, enough. No more, no more saying anime food looks so good. I can't believe my own moderator started this. Oh my gosh. Guys, get a mandolin. For this step, you really want to make sure that you have a mandolin. This is incredibly annoying to do with a knife. You can do this with a knife, but if you're really serious about making consistent crispy fried shallots at home, you will get a mandolin for this. Okay. Um, yeah, but my issue with Whole Cake Island is that they completely rewrote everything that I loved about him. That he didn't need this additional retcon backstory. Yuck. Uh, I have not thrown a mandolin, although that would be a good idea to, of something to put on my wish list. Okay, guys, guess what? All of my shallots, they have been nicely and beautifully uh, sliced up. We're going to go ahead and start preheating the oil in just a moment. I'm going to go ahead and wash off my knife because, again, this is a carbon steel knife, so we don't want to leave it dirty for too long, lest it oxidizes, lest it rusts, right? We have about two more minutes on the cook time of the chicken itself, guys, and then we'll let it cool off, and then we'll shred it up um, and make a beautiful salad. Is everybody excited for this? I want to hear a nice yes, chef, please and thank you. Okay, just wiping this off. I'm not gonna use the rest of the shallot for today, I think. 
you know, we'll just do something else with this later on. Lovely. Okay. And actually, we'll do a bit of a recap session, guys. So, we're doing today a goiga bap kai. A goiga bap kai is a Vietnamese chicken cabbage salad. I'm using up all the leftovers that I had at home. So, on the stove at the moment is my chicken beautifully poaching with homemade chicken stock, ginger, garlic, and scallions. We made this really, really nice tray of roasted peanuts as well. Roasted peanuts, these are going to be the topping for the salad today, right? I'm gonna have one as a little snack, as a little treat. Mmm. Mmm. Gotta say, a home toasted peanut, incredible. That's a lot better than a story about one. Wow. We're going to make delicious crispy fried shallots. In my fridge is some pickling shallots as well. Um, we can now go ahead and just take this and just shut it off the heat, guys. Everybody, the chicken has now officially uh, finished poaching. So we're going to go ahead and take that off the heat. And then in a moment's time, we'll also be shredding it up. Okay, so I'm just gonna go ahead. I'm gonna get rid of it. Lovely. Okay, and I'm gonna go sh shut off this heat. And the only thing I'm going to do, guys, we're going to now deep fry uh, the shallots, for the crispy shallots, that is, right? And so in order to do that, the first thing that we have to ensure of is that my cooking vessel, my cooking receptacle, right? This little stainless steel saucepan is nice and dry. And now I'm going to go ahead and put in um, some peanut oil. Do I season my nuts as I roast them? Can you if you didn't? Yes, you can. You absolutely can. I chose to keep them intentionally bland, though. I keep them intentionally bland, and I'll be able to season them later on. But you absolutely can just salt them. Okay, guys. Oh, and I'm going to get to your hex clad question in just a second. So, uh, peanut oil. You want to use any kind of neutral, neutral cooking oil for this. Okay? Peanut, think peanut oil, think canola oil. Think vegetable oil, that kind of a thing, okay? And I'm looking for, you know, in a vessel of this size, maybe like a cup and a half of oil, something like that. Just to make sure that it gets like a proper deep fry. Now, typically, I actually don't really enjoy deep frying at home. It takes up a lot of oil. It's very difficult to get rid of that oil, but I'm now going to determine, is it actually worth it to make your own crispy shallots? So guys, I'm going to go ahead and put this onto a heat. I have a little something called a temperature gun. Um, you can just get some sort of like a stick in uh, thermometer for this, but I have a temperature gun, which I just use. Um, you don't want to put this in your eye, by the way, because it has an LED. Um, what this does is it tells me the temperature of the oil. And I'm going to be shooting for around 350 degrees on my frying oil. You really don't want to make sure that it's too hot. Because if it's a little bit too hot, what's going to happen is uh, the outside of the shallot is going to burn by the time that the actual inside ends up cooking through. Okay, so let's talk about the crispy shallots one more time. We'll talk about why this functions and why you need a thinly sliced shallot. I actually don't know if mine are gonna be successful. I think I might've cut mine a little bit too thick. I'm going to just go ahead and gently break this up. Again, you don't wanna do this too far in advance because then your shallots will become really, really wet. It'll become very difficult to actually deep fry, okay? So I'm just breaking these up a little bit and then we're going to fry them and put them onto a plate with a little paper towel on it. Okay, so let's talk about my crispy shallots one more time. Um, they need to be nice and thin. Why do they need to be thin? So that they actually get crispy. The idea is they're so thin that the majority of the moisture inside of the shallot ends up evaporating out. When they're thick, there will still be an, an amount of moisture trapped inside of the shallot that will never be able to escape. So by having them super, super thin, they need to become crisps. Right? They need to become crisps even when they cool down. They need to become properly crispy shallots. In order to get properly crispy shallots, you have to cook the liquid out of them. Okay? So, we're just waiting on the oil to heat on up. We're going to get it up until 350 degrees Fahrenheit or so. Um, oh, actually, 350 might be a little bit too high. I have a little cross reference here for crispy shallots because, again, I haven't done this very often. Okay! Actually, I completely lied. I almost destroyed my shallots. Guys, we're overheating the oil right now. We're intentionally overheating, and I'm gonna to explain to you why. This is not a commercial deep fryer. This is a small saucepan with a cup and a half of oil inside of it. So what does that mean? Why am I even pointing this out to all of you? When you have a massive volume of oil, it doesn't lose its heat. When you're frying something at home in a cup of oil, you put something uh, cold inside, right, cold shallots into the hot oil, it's going to cool it down. We're actually shooting for between 250 and 275 degrees Fahrenheit. But by first heating this peanut oil up until 300 degrees Fahrenheit, which we'll check in a second, we'll see how that's going, okay. Currently it's at 223, so it's getting there, it's getting nice and hot. Okay, it's not heating the most evenly, so I'm just gonna turn down the heat a little bit and just let it go a little bit slower. By heating it up to 300 degrees, 
okay? We're going to uh, then cool it down when we add it in the shallots, okay? Um, and we're not going to be actually using a fryer basket, of course, because we're not deep frying, right? Um, I do have this bad boy instead. This is something called a spider. And so with this tool, we'll actually be taking everything out of it. Okay, now let's go ahead and set up my plate station. Plate station, PlayStation. Hmm, there is something to be said. Okay, I'm just gonna go ahead and set up my plate. We're going to go ahead and set, just set this up with a little paper towel, okay? Why do we set up the paper towel? Because that's going to make sure that uh, we're just soaking up any of the excess oil. Let's go ahead and just check, check that temperature one more time. We got 256 degrees Fahrenheit. I'm heating this up on like a medium, okay? So that the oil just heats up nice and evenly like so. Just give this an occasional rotation. But guys, when it comes to also deep frying safety, we have to talk about safety. You wanna make sure that it's not overly filled with oil. You never wanna go past like 40% capacity in your pot because you have a lot of extra volume from the food and then you have the additional volume of the bubbles. So for safe deep frying, you never wanna go past 50% at maximum, but for safety, 40 to 33%. Okay, um, what are my hexclad thoughts? Yes, yeah, so sorry. So here's my hexclad thoughts. Overpriced for what it is, but fine in function. So for all of you that may have been living under a rock, or for those of you that are uninitiated, what is a hex clad pan? A hex clad pan is this new up and coming trendy influencer branded, um, you know, set of pans that come, you know, it's mostly from TikTok, right? It's mostly from TikTok. That's where you really, really see a lot of it. And so why are they called a hex clad? They have like this hexagon pattern. And so what they have is, uh, they say, they have like these slight indentations where they have their own nonstick coating. And then on top of it is like the steel. So it has like this hexagon pattern, under it is the nonstick, and then the top of it is the sta uh, stainless steel. And what do they say about it? They say you can use a metal utensil on it, you can use a metal utensil on a nonstick pan. So there is a problem with it, and I'm going to explain to you exactly why. You do not use nonstick pans for the same reason, uh, for the same functions as you was a stainless steel pan. You can't heat up an empty nonstick pan because it's bad for the Teflon coating over time. Stainless steel pans, do a really good job of being able to be increased to a super high amount of heat. Non-stick pans do not actually really like being heated up super high, right? It degrades the coating over time. So by having a pan that says you can sear a steak on it, you can do all these different things on it on a high temperature, but then, you know, when you actually get down to it, you're just damaging the non-stick coating that's there over time. And because of the fact that there's so much stainless steel on it, it's actual non-stick properties aren't even that amazing. So it just shouldn't exist, but it's fine. It's function is fine. It'll saute something fine. But in regards to sealing a steak or making eggs, there's so much better cookware. That's a tenth of the cost. Okay, guys, my oil, it's 300 degrees. Okay, in some parts of it's 300. It didn't heat up necessarily the most evenly. So it's 323 in some sections, a little bit cooler in others. Let's go ahead and go in with my shallots guys and so with the shallots i'm going to not use my fingers because i am not a seasoned deep fry guy i'm going to be just cooking these for around five minutes or so i'm going to do this i think in like two batches right we'll do two batches of shallots here you don't really want to go super high with batch cooking when you're doing home deep frying um actually wait what am i doing guys i think i should just pick up the shallots and put them into the spider instead of using chopsticks like that. I was about to like drop and dunk them all in. That would have been pretty bad. Okay, let's just take them and let's submerge them into the oil. Lovely. And now the oil temperature should drop. And guys, look at the bubbles. Look at how much it's frothing up. It's a good thing that we didn't actually put in more shallots. It's a good thing that we didn't put in more oil because if we did, what would have happened is it would have started boiling over. Okay guys, I'm going to now go ahead and uh, set the timer on to five minutes. five, six minutes or so. And we're trying to get this temperature now to around 250, right? It's actually perfectly at 250, right? 245 exactly. We're using the chopsticks just to stir it around, break it around. And now guys, this is gonna be the moment of truth. Do you think the shallots are gonna get crispy? Do you think we actually cut them finely enough? Chat, press one if you think we cut them finely enough. Press one if you think they're gonna get crispy. Press two if you don't actually believe me. Um, is there a specific thermal gun that you recommend? I mean, I'll just recommend the one that I have. This is the laser grip, and it seems to be fine. Press one, lovely, good. Glad that so many people are so confident in this. 245, a little low. 
So again, I'm just slightly going up in temperature. And again, we overshot the temperature. We overshot it to 300 degrees so that we can then drop the heat. Um, I don't typically, again, I don't really love deep frying at home. Um, I find that it's a little bit annoying, but when it comes to something like uh, crispy shallots, it takes up so little space in a saucepan that I don't think I actually mind. And again, every now and then, guys, I'm just going to go in with my chopsticks. I'm just going to stir it occasionally. I'm going to make sure that nothing is sticking to the bottom of anything. Okay? And you see all this bubbling. All that bubbling is all the moisture coming out of the shallot. And we need to evaporate that moisture. Ghoul Angel, are you serious? Where is your confidence? Also, everybody, if you haven't already done so, please, I'm going to show my Patreon again. Check out my Patreon. You can type in exclamation mark Patreon in the chat whenever you would like. Um, if you would like to support what we do here, I'm trying to be able to do this full time. Um, and so, any and all support would be really appreciated. While that's deep frying, I'm actually just going to go ahead and take uh, my chicken and put it onto a plate so that it can cool down enough that we're just able to shred it up beautifully. And once we're done with the crispy shallots, it will tend to the rest of the salad. Okay. Oh, and it does smell pretty wonderful, guys. The deep frying shallots, that, that is a very, very beautiful smell that it actually has at the moment. So, I'm going to just go ahead and just take the chicken out. And by the way, all of this chicken stock, like all this cooking stock, you don't throw this away. Please, I'm going to serve this for myself as a nice little uh, beverage. I love having delicious, freshly made chicken stock. Do not throw this away. We don't need it for the salad, but I love having chicken stock as just like a drink. I drink it regularly, even like instant bouillon. If anybody's ever dated me, they've seen me take like instant bouillon and make like a beverage out of it. Several of my exes in the past have witnessed me doing that. And thus they are now my exes, would have thought. But, okay, let's go ahead and just give this a little, a little stir skis. And again, we're looking for these to get nice and crispy. And you can see they're starting to pick up a little bit of color, right? Some of them are starting to get nice and golden brown. Um, but we don't want this heat too high, guys. There is a balance here. This has to be between 250 and 275. There is a balance. If it's too hot, what's going to happen is the outside is going to burn by the time that the water cooks out. But cooking it nice and medium and slow, the water evaporates and then the sugar is caramelized and then everything gets nice and crispy. Krissa, I didn't, I, that's great. I'm glad that I don't, I'm happy for you. Okay, so I'm just breaking up all the clusters. And yeah, the thick pieces are definitely struggling a little bit, but the thin ones are doing amazing at the moment. Okay, so we're just letting it go, guys, for another three minutes or so. No, Zinaltra, I've never sucked on a bouillon cube. That I've never done before. Okay, I'm gonna have a nice little sip of water. Mm. And by the way, when we are deep frying, we don't really wanna be juggling too many other tasks because this is something that does need to be almost like babysat. Right? Because at any point, something can happen, something can ignite, right? something can splash up, right? so it can happen. So you just want to make sure that you're keeping a nice, watchful eye over everything that's going on. These are your babies. Treat them with respect, guys. Treat them well. But I got to say, these shallots are now taking on a beautiful, beautiful color. Um, yeah, they're, and they're also going to crisp up as they continue to cool. So I think six minutes is going to be my sweet spot for today. You just don't want them to turn too dark brown or anything. So that you see like that nice golden, beautiful color that they're taking on. Right, that's what we're looking for. In fact, I don't know if this even looks nice enough to do so, but let's get a, let's get a still of this. And maybe I'll decide to use it at some point or another. I did like it when it was bubbling up though. That was pretty cool. Okay, um, the peanuts, they've cooled off properly now. I'm going to go ahead and just transfer these to a little bowl and we're done with the sheet tray. And let's just go ahead and give these bad boys a little stir. And again, they are going to slightly crisp up and continue to brown as we take them off because, um, you know, they still have like the hot oil on them. You also just want to make sure that none of them are touching the edges of the saucepan because you can see when they touch the edges of the saucepan, they do get a little bit too dark, right? Because they're not just frying anymore. They're now actually in direct contact uh, with that metal. And so we are trying to avoid that, okay? So, oh, I tapped that. That was, that was a, almost a fatal flaw. And so as they cool down, that's when they'll really, really hit like their peak crispiness because they have all been cooked out of all of their precious moisture. And I no longer need my sheet tray for anything, so I'm gonna go ahead and get rid of that. My sheet tray is still nice and clean. It just has some foil on it. Okay, 35 seconds. And guys, you know what? I'm looking at the color of these shallots. These do look quite dark brown now. I'm feeling like I should probably pull them off at this stage. 
because they've completely stopped bubbling aside from like the really thick pieces. And when they stop bubbling, uh, that's a good indication of what? That's a good indication that we've actually cooked out the liquid. So I'm going to just move some of them along. I'm gonna move some of them aside. We're going to use the spider to just get rid of all of the excess oil because we still need the oil for the next batch of shallots. And I'm gonna go right onto the paper towels, scoop all of it up guys, drain off all that excess liquid. That's my timer, thank you. I know that it's going, I know. I'll be there in a second. Okay, and again, I love having this tool, guys. I love having a spider. But a spider just gets in there so easily, even on such a small saucepan like this. It does a really nice job. Okay, um, okay, timer, I, I got the idea. Please, thank you. I'm, I'm okay. I'm okay, I, I know, I know, buddy. Okay, I'm going nose. Okay, and I'm just getting rid of the last few pieces of shallot that could still be um, sort of like floating around a little bit. Right. We don't want to overfill this, right? Because then it could always like splash up. It might not cook very evenly. Hmm. I do almost wish I had like a finer mesh to really, really like clean up this oil. You know. Right, because we still have like all these little particles in it, which is okay because we're only doing two batches. But if we did any more, they would like burn up and they would make everything like super, super bitter. Um, I'm just spreading out those shallots like so. I have like one big chunk of shallot here that I still need to get rid of. Um, I do actually have a very small mesh that I could probably use to clean up the oil really quickly. Let me see if I can find it. I did lose it at some point and I think it's still lost. Okay, you know what guys? I think it's gonna be okay. I think it's gonna be okay. Um, so, what are we looking to do? We're looking to heat this oil back up to around 300. Whoa, this is at 361, what is happening? That is way too hot. I'm gonna shut off the heat. Give it like a second just to cool off a little bit. I'm going to just continue to remove all of my little teeny tiny chunks of crispy shallot. But uh, the oil has now overheated completely because we're not looking for 370 degrees. We're not looking for 350. We're looking for this to be at 300 and then for the oil to then plummet back down. Can I please get a yes chef, please and thank you. I don't want you to have burnt shallots. These though, those do look beautiful. Those are some beautiful looking shallots. Okay. It's cooling off, it's doing the thing. Still at 375, still at 371. Just gonna mix it around slightly. And hopefully that like distributes the oil temperature a little bit. Although you could always just add in some like fresh oil if you would like um, to cool it off. Don't add water to cool it off. I don't know if any of you guys thought to do that. Um, also, by the way, while these shallots are cooling, um, you do wanna salt them now. If you wanna have some seasoned crispy shallots, the best time to do it is now because that oil uh, it, it sticks, right, the, like, uh, outside of the oil on the shallots, it sticks to the salt. So anytime you deep fry, the best time to season it would be immediately after. Okay. Can I add Dr. Pepper to cool it off? No. <laughs> please, please don't. Okay, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm actually going to add in the next batch of shallots off the heat, is my thinking. Because I think if I do it off the heat, what's going to happen is... Uh, it's going to cool it down enough, and then whenever I feel like it's going to hit back... What am I doing? Chat, what am I doing? Whenever I feel like it uh, goes back down, it's going to then hit uh, 250, 275 degrees again. It's going to be perfect. Such is the challenges of like batch cooking uh, at home, especially when you're like deep frying. Also, my flame is a little bit dangerous. I can easily hit the saucepan and then, you know, fling a bunch of hot oil into my face. Right? There you go, all the shallots going inside. Whoa, look at all those bubbles. Look how, ta look how tall it's going, right? And it's going to settle down. But the reason it's bubbling so much is because that's all of the excess liquid on the outside on the top of the shallot. So guys, all I'm going to do is I'm gonna take these chopsticks yet again, and we're just breaking them up. We're breaking up the clusters and we're moving everything along, okay? There you go, very nice. So let's go ahead and get a temperature read on this. Now it's at 237. Perfect. So the shallots did exactly what we needed them to do, guys. It cooled down the oil. And now we go ahead and we cook this for another six minutes. There you go. Nice and easy. Beautifully delicious homemade crispy shallots. This actually wasn't so bad. Typically, I hate deep frying like large things, but I actually think making homemade like crispy shallots, this might just be worth the effort. Um, in the future, I would love to get a mandolin because I do think my shallots were cut actually just too thick. Right? I can tell you that that oil is probably too hot now. Ah, 235, that's perfect, that's just fine. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and just take these shallots out. Let's go ahead and just inspect them really quickly. Sorry for how long this is taking. Guys, today's a long stream. 
Wow, we've only been live for two hours. These are my crispy shallots. Um, they do look a little bit darker than they actually are. That's just because the shallots have so much sugar in them. Mmm. Oh my goodness. You know what? I could have pulled them out a little bit sooner. But that is still pretty fantastic. Yeah, these could have gone a little bit sooner. Um, I think I could do probably a minute less later on. I was just tempted to leave it on longer because I had some thick pieces that needed to catch up. So I know it looks burnt. It's because it slightly is. And that's okay. That happens to the best of us. Um, okay, I'm just going to go ahead and just transfer this to a separate little container like so. But they are crispy, guys, right? Like, you hear that sound. Even when they've completely cooled down, they retain their crispiness. And the reason for that is because we cooked out all of the liquid. When you have things that are super, super thin and super crispy, you cook out the liquid, you cook out the moisture, right? And they still continue to hold on to it. Beautiful. So, there we go. A little bit too dark. It happens. Um... Well, to dad's kissing, it sounds like you've already let people know for me. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, so when we are when we are temping the actual shouts and the oil, we're looking to temp like the oil itself, right? Not like the sides or anything, right? So yeah, we're still holding it on around like 250 or so. Beautiful. And uh, yeah, now we know exactly how to compensate for the temperature. Right, so that last batch of shallots, I would say it's a little bit too dark, although it tastes delicious. It has like that nice sweetness, it has that nice crispiness. It's just like a little too bitter for me. Okay, there you go, perfect. And I'm going to go ahead and fold up one more paper towel. Going to New York, and do you have any good rec uh, restaurant recommendations that are not too expensive? Yes, one of my favorite restaurants is this little Japanese market called Kokoron Market. You're going to go there and you're going to have the Japanese curry and you're gonna have your mind blown. Next, you're going to go to Joe Shanghai and you're going to go and get soup dumplings at Joe Shanghai. Those are some of my favorite places in New York to go ahead and get stuff at. You do that, and then you come back to me. Okay. So guys, again, we're just continuing to stir this around. We're making sure that no shallots are left unstirred, that none of them are touching the sides of the super, super hot pan at the moment. Okay? And then we're going to do everything else. Is everybody still paying attention? Is everybody still following along with the recipe today? With the dish, not a recipe. Can I please get a yes, chef? Please and thank you. Sorry if it's a good question, but where is your accent from? That's a non- I mean, that's a, that's a nice question. Um, some people are disrespectful about it, but you're fine. Um, so, alter ego. My accent is a combination of a couple of different things. So, first of all, I do have a slight speech impediment. I can't pronounce my R sounds. Um, that's a slight thing. The second thing is I'm from Brooklyn. I'm from Brooklyn, New York. I've lived here my whole life. I grew up in the Russian side of Brooklyn, although I don't have a Russian accent. Uh, if anything, my accent is slightly shaped by watching The Sopranos. Not even looking at the Italians in South Brooklyn, but it was through watching The Sopranos, I think I took it on because I was like, wow, that's cool. I want to sound like that. I'm pretty sure that is what happened to me. Okay, again, I'm just moving around the shallots every so often, making sure that nothing is touching those sides. That last batch was a little bit too dark, and that's okay. This one's going to be much better. We're only going to cook this for about a minute longer, guys, at most. Okay, it's okay if we have some that are a little too soft. It's okay, just break them up, break up the clusters, stir it all around, turn down that heat slightly. There you go, beautiful. And then I'm also autistic, so I kind of taught myself how to talk, right? Um, anyhow, it's just, it's just like a part of it. I have like a lot of very like specific speech things right? in regards to uh, some of my motor skills with my mouth and the way that I make certain sounds. So, I have a weird amalgamation of a lot of different things. Here's my answer to you as to where my accent's from. Okay, guys, so you know what? You see the shallots, you see where they're at right now? I'm not actually going to push them any further. I'm going to now undershoot these ones, and hopefully, I think, uh, I think they'll be perfect, actually. So let's just go ahead, take them out. Let's drain them of all of that excess oil and put them right in. Lovely. And let's go ahead and take it all out. Take it out, take it out, take it out. Excellent. Tap it, tap it, tap it. Nice. You know what, guys? I think I'm going to do this again in the future. I didn't actually expect to enjoy the process of making crispy fried shallots at home, but uh, this actually wasn't so bad. As long as I set up some sort of an oil filtration system, I think this would be actually okay for me to do. Okay, and I'm just moving them around. I'm breaking up like this cluster of, uh, you know, fried shallots that we have here. And one last uh, seasoning of salt, guys. If you're a famous uh, actor or something, I feel like people would do imitations of you. Thank you. Well, guess what? I'm going to have the biggest cooking show in the world. So people will do it anyways, right? It's just going to happen. Season it with a little bit of salt. Excellent. 
Okay, and guys, that's it. That's all that we really needed to do for the crispy shallots. Um, I'm going to go ahead and put a couple of things away, guys, because again, we are cooking at home. And when you cook at home, you know what that means? You have to clean as you go. And then we're going to do a recap session, and then we're going to get into the final stages of today, which is we have to make the dressing, aka the dipping sauce. Um, you know, we have to bring everything together. We have to slice some aromatics, slice some scallions. That's my timer on my phone going off through the shallots that have already been finished. So everybody, please bear with me really, really quickly as I get this done. Can I please get a yes, chef? Is everybody watching still? Is everybody still listening? Even if I'm putting things away, I don't want you to leave me. I don't want any of you guys to leave me. So, just getting all of that done, finishing all this up now, putting my tongs away as well. I don't want to need that little plate either. Excellent. Okay, everybody, so what are we doing today? We're doing a beautiful Vietnamese salad called Goiga Bap Kai. Uh, Goiga Bap Kai is a chicken cabbage salad with a lot of different components. We have some homemade pickled shallots. We have some homemade crispy shallots. We have, um, you know, some cabbage that's been sitting with some salt. And then we also have uh, chicken that's been beautifully poached alongside a really, really delicious chicken stock. And then we're also going to be doing a really beautiful dressing slash dipping sauce with ginger and fish sauce and garlic and scallions. And it's going to be amazing because you cannot have Vietnamese cooking without a uh, fish sauce. I'm going to have a nice little sip of water. Let's go ahead and inspect the next batch of crispy shallots. Oh, excuse me. That's not it. So these are the last ones. These are a little bit like too cooked, but they're really, really beautifully crispy. And this is the second batch that I did. And this is a lot more of what I was looking for, right? So these are a lot more like nice and golden brown and not like a dark brown or anything. And they continue to brown as I sort of let them sit out here. And now I'm gonna have a little taste. Mm. You know what? A freshly fried crispy shallot, you actually cannot beat it. That is genuinely as delicious as it gets. That is so good. Even the thick pieces got crispy somewhat. Mm. Mm -mm 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 -mm. Guys, I can't believe I'm gonna say this. Actually deep fry at home. Actually make crispy shallots at home. You need a little temperature thing, right? You need to make sure they have a saucepan for you. You need to have the oil. Homemade crispy fried shallots are so much better than the store-bought condiment ones. Oh my goodness. Wow, I didn't understand. I mean, this was, a, this was never something that I've actually made before. Right? It's always like something, it's a very restauranty thing, right? It's also, you know, used a lot in like Asian cooking, but I didn't know how easy this was. That is a beautiful shallot. Lovely. We no longer need this plate. That is now finished. So one of our lovely components for today's salad is done. Wow. I am very happy about how that went. I was not expecting to enjoy that so much. I was just doing this because that's, you know, traditional. Um, but I'm seeing the beauty in it now. Okay, guys, the only other thing I'm going to do really quickly, I'm going to go ahead and just chop up some of my roasted nuts. Um, and then we're going to go ahead and just get rid of some of the skins. And a nice thing about roasting, I've actually realized, is by having roasted them, all of the husks have naturally fallen off of the peanut. Well, the majority of them at least. And look at these beautiful golden roasted peanuts, right? And we made sure that we didn't overcook them or anything, guys. Okay, we didn't overcook them. They're beautiful, they look incredible. We're just picking off all of the husks, getting them out of here, making sure not to break them up too much because uh, the husks are a little bit unpleasant. You wanna hear what kind of music I like? Um, so this is a bit of a weird question for me because I feel like with a lot of artists, I only maybe typically like one or two songs from them. I don't have any genres I explicitly don't listen to. I'll listen to anything as long as it's good and it's made with any intention, right? Um, and so I don't like any big industry music, typically speaking. Right? Um, I don't typically enjoy anything that's solely made for profit and not out of artistry, which might be the most pretentious answer ever, but you can really, really feel the difference. Um, as far as favorite artists, man, I gotta say, I do love Kelo Kelo Benito. Yeah, I do love KKB. One of my favorites. Um, otherwise, I listen to a little bit of everything. I listened at some point to a lot of Fox Capture Plan. I love Topa Zolite, if you know him from Rhythm Games, right? It used to be very prolific uh, in that world. Um, it was just like that was the music that people like played the charts to, right? So uh, quite a big range of things. I like Run the Jewels quite a bit as well. Um, so a lot of different specific things. Uh, Spiffmeister, thank you for stopping by. It was lovely to have you. Okay guys, we've removed all of the husks from the peanuts. 
Okay, and now we're just going to go ahead and give these a nice little chop. It's okay if we don't get rid of every single last husk as long as we got the majority of it. Um, now, as for a good way to do this, you can use a mortar and pestle, I'm sure. I'm just chopping this up coarsely um, because this is going to be a garnish for the salad. But so we're just getting that initial chop through and the better that you roast them, the more they're going to pop out. System or disturbed, I don't like either. Sorry. Um, okay, lovely. And I'm going to go ahead and mix this. And also my shirt, it's a, I think this is a math lock band. I got to see him live once in some New Jersey basement under questionable circumstances and it was fine. I got a shirt because the shirt looked cool. Called Cat Bamboo, okay. Okay, I think that should be enough chopping through the peanuts. And now let's go ahead and just scoop all of it up. And let's just get this into my little container, the best that I possibly can, of course. I could have probably just used a mortar and pestle just to crush these up a few times, but I think this is just fine. Come on guys, back in. I'm not gonna get any of the dust in though. That's what I'm gonna try to avoid. Right, get rid of as much of this uh, peanut dust as possible here. Dress, listen, I don't, yeah, no, no, the way that I dress is purely because I like to dress this way. I will never wear shirts from like bands I don't listen to, for instance, right? But, um, it's just the kind of aesthetic that I have. So guys, all of my peanuts, beautifully roasted. My timer keeps on going for some reason, despite me having already told it not to. I'm going to go ahead and clean up my cutting board really quickly. Okay guys, and now is one of the most essential, essential components. We have to now drain the liquid from the cabbage. Okay, it is, oh, excuse me, that's not the cabbage at all. Let's go ahead and just go to the cutting board. Guys, my cabbage has been sitting with all of the salt. Thank you, the stuffed pink owl, I appreciate it. So, guys, we have this big bowl of cabbage. It's been sitting here with salt. Why did we salt this in advance? We salted this in advance, not just to season it, of course, not just to collapse it, but to get rid of all of this. This is all cabbage water, my friends. And this cabbage water, we do not want it in our salad. This cabbage water is going to make it all watery and bland. So I'm just going to be squeezing, 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 squeezing as hard as I can. Okay, and then I'm pouring it out into my waste bowl. And then I'm taking it again. I'm picking it up and I'm squeezing, squeezing, squeezing as hard as I can. Right, we wanna get rid of all of this cabbage water, as much of it as possible. We're squeezing it to death, right? And then we're going to just move it around. We're going to break up the clusters a little bit. And we're going to squeeze it, squeeze it, squeeze it, squeeze it. Again, look at all of that water that's coming out of the cabbage, guys. This would have otherwise have ended up inside of your salad if we did not do this step. Okay, so we're squeezing all of it out and then we're just getting rid of it. And this is how you level up your cabbage salads. If you mix it all together and you ate it immediately, it'd be great. But then as soon as you put your cabbage salad into the fridge, I mean, all of it just becomes soggy. It's a tragedy, really. Okay. Continuing to squeeze and squeezing it with all of the force that I have inside of my petite little paws. There we go. And dump it all out. Nice. Okay. And look at how much volume we ended up losing, guys. Look at the volume of cabbage that we were left with. Now, it's fine if it's not completely dry. That's like chill, right? It's going to contribute to some moisture in the salad, but we're trying to realistically get rid of a good bit of it. Um, okay, so one last big squeeze, I suppose, that'll do just fine. There you go, and there you go. Awesome, okay, that is my cabbage that has now been wrung out of all of that excess moisture. Doesn't it also lose crunch? It does lose crunch. And so if you wanna avoid that, you have to do freshly sliced cabbage for every salad. Ooh, <clears throat> I got a peanut stuck in my throat. <clears throat> Yikes, I had a peanut, <laughs> like, a, like a husk of it got inside. Ooh, that was brutal. <clears throat> <clears throat> okay, I think we're back. So, cabbage, devoid of all of its moisture. So, let's go ahead and think about what else we want to go in here. We're going to actually take some of my shallot pickling liquid, um, and we're going to throw it in here, because that's going to be basically the dressing for the salad. It's going to provide some acidity, and um, it's going to provide some sweetness. It's going to be really, really nice. So, let's go ahead and go on over to that. I'm just going to go ahead and dump out all of this liquid. One second, guys. Thank you very much. 
So remember my pickled shallots. This is one of the essential components for you today. I love having a quick pickled allium at home. These are my quick pickled shallots. And we no longer need this paper towel that was helping to keep all of the brine nicely submerged, right? So this paper towel we can go ahead and do without now. Lovely. And now, guys, here's what we're going to do. We're going to go ahead and spoon in a bunch of it, but we're not just spooning uh, the shallots in. We're also going to be spooning in that liquid, okay? So let's go ahead and just pick some, right? Just like so. We're just trying to avoid any of the coriander seeds that could be in here. These are my delicious quick pickled shallots alongside my chilies. Let's get a couple of big, you know, it might just do almost all of this. Yeah. Big, big, big spoonfuls of this stuff, guys. Delicious. Okay. I'm gonna save some food later to food myself at some point. Okay, so all of my pickled shallots go inside. Let's get a couple more. And then we're going to get some nice big spoons of all of that liquid. And this is going to start almost the dressing for the salad. Right, and I think, uh, let's get one more spoonful of shallots. I'm tired of saying shallots, guys. I'm so sick of it at this point. Okay, and let's go ahead and get rid of it. Ooh, nice and spicy. Ooh, those chilies are really coming through. That is beautiful. I love having quick pickled alliums at home, guys. Okay, so now we wanna go ahead and basically massage and incorporate all of that pickling, pickling liquid. So we've gotten rid of all of like the soggy, bland cabbage water, and now we've replaced it essentially with all of this. So let's just go ahead and just take it and break everything up and mix everything around inside. Very nice. Because you have like these big, thick clusters of cabbage, you wanna just really pick them up, break them up, pick them up, break them up, that kind of thing. No pickled butter, please no pickled butter. Please no pickled butter, I'm good, I'm begging you. Okay, and that should be just about it. Again, we're just really, really mixing it through. We're breaking up all of the existing clumps that we have in here, right? Let's give the whole thing a nice little taste. Mm. Enough salt, nice and acidic and nice and spicy. Guys, that is remarkable. That is so good. Even just by itself, even by itself, that would make a phenomenal salad, but we're not done. Chat, we're not done yet. Are we done? I wanna hear a nice resounding no chef. Please and thank you. Because now it's time to do the rest of the components and then the last but not least step is going to be building a really, really lovely dressing. So guys, I have some scallions here. I wanna get some scallions into the salad. We also have some cilantro, which we'll be doing in a second. I wanna get some nice, beautifully thinly sliced uh, scallions. And so, we're going to slice them. We don't chop them, but we slice them. So we're going to go ahead and take them and we're just going to go ahead and we could separate the whites and the greens, although I don't really think it matters that much for this. Fine, fine, I guess we will. We'll, we'll just cut it in half like this. We're just gonna cut the whole thing really, really nice and thin, okay? And now we're going to bundle the whole thing up, guys, and on a huge bias, I'm slicing it. I'm slicing it, I'm slicing it, okay? I'm bundling it up and I'm slicing. And I'm slicing these bad boys really nice and thin. You can't have too many scallions, okay? It's scallions makes the world go round. And I know this is so much work for just a salad, but I've also been going really, really slowly. I've been keeping you from your studies, that's okay. This is, this is important. You are learning uh, how to make the best home food. And then we're just, just continuing to slice it nice and thin to whatever texture that you desire, but I just want this to all incorporate beautifully into the salad. Nice. Okay, almost done, guys. One more moment. There you go. And then let's just take these last few pieces and bundle all of them up. This is more important. You're absolutely correct. Just take them and we're continuing to slice them nice and thin into these nice thin strips. And again, it's fine if you have a couple of big pieces, guys. Right? It is scallions. They're beautiful in all shapes and forms. Big or small, they're always gonna be perfect. Okay, let's take them and let's just scoop all of them up. There you go. And then I'm also going to just clean off my cutting board really quickly because all of this is just dirty. Okay. And then we're also going to need some cilantro. Guys, you cannot have this salad without any cilantro. If you can't have cilantro because of the soap thing, 
Maybe some parsley would be fine. I don't know if Vietnamese cilantro would be fine. I'm not sure. But guys, a nice, big, generous bundle of cilantro. Ooh, I'm excited to plate all of this. And we're going to save some to garnish. So, everybody, here's what's gonna happen. We're going to go ahead and take the cilantro off the stems because I don't love the texture of the stems. I find them a little bit fibrous. So I'm going to just go through every single last one of these and we're going to pick off any like big thick stems that they may have. If they have little thin stems, that's totally fine by me. Like this, you know, you just trim this off and it's fine, right? But then the big thick stems, these are the ones I'm really trying to get rid of, okay? So just take it and go through this entire pile. You can leave it if you would like. I just don't love the fibrous texture, okay? And we're continuing just to pluck it, and we're plucking it, and we're plucking it. Lovely. Does anybody have any questions for me, by the way, at the moment? I'm here to help you all learn how to cook. Hello, Kitsune. It's okay. Kitsune, we still have the most fun thing to come. How did I get so cute? Estrogen. I hope that answers your question. Um, you're going to get to the most exciting portion that I want all of you to hold on for, which is actually going to be the making of the dressing, which I'll be doing inside of my mocha hit it. So I'm pretty, pretty excited about it. Okay, and we're going through all of it. Nice. And again, like the little stems are totally fine. What are they, banned Twitch? I'll go to YouTube. We'll figure it out. They're not gonna go through with the TikTok ban. There's no way that they will. Okay, guys, we're continuing. We're continuing, we're almost done. Yeah, all of these stems are just fine. So, everybody. Oh, am I a fan of Chef John from Food Wishes? Of course I am, Boozy. You cannot not be. I love Chef John, even if I don't love all of his videos, I love his voice. It is time to learn how to slice herbs. We don't chop, but we slice in this household. So let me explain something to you. When you chop something, you use your knife like an ax. You use a tiny portion of it and you end up crushing everything on the way back down. To get finely sliced herbs, you need a beautiful sharp knife and you need to use the full length of the knife. You need to use the full length of it. We're going to use all of the surface area of the knife with minimal vertical force. force. Excuse me. So guys, we're going to take all of my lovely, beautiful, fresh cilantro here and I'm just going to go ahead and bundle all of it up. There you go, just like so. And then I'm going to place it down on my cutting board. I'm going to hold it like a baby bird. Not so firmly that I'm crushing its little brains out, but not so gently that it flies away. And then you're going to go ahead and take your little bundled up baby bird. Oh, right, you're going to take it right here. Okay, guys? You're going to bundle it, bundle it, bundle it. And now you want to slice it with as little vertical force as possible. We're using the full length of the knife. All of it. Nicely and thinly sliced. This is what the baby bird was destined for. Chat, you wish that was you. That's right. I don't know if I'd be allowed to stream that on Twitch. Okay, guys. We're slicing it. 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 We're never chopping. We never chop in this household. Chat, do we chop? I want to hear a nice no chef. Right, we're just going through this pile. I'm going back in through these leaves. There you go. We never chop, and that way you get beautifully sliced herbs that aren't crushed. Because when you crush your herbs, you end up oxidizing them and they lose so much of the flavor as they just end up sitting out. And we're going to save some of this, just a little bit of it, as a nice garnish. And the rest of it I'm going to pick up and throw into the salad. Uh, Tarina, that's a little bit much. That's a little much. Okay. And now I'm going to go ahead and just set this aside for garnishing later on. Okay, and I'm gonna go ahead and put this behind me. Okay guys, one of my last steps. We're going to now go ahead and break down this chicken. We have the chicken legs and the chicken thighs. We're going to go ahead and pull this apart. And then we're actually going to make the dressing for today, which I'm pretty excited about, I have to say. So guys, uh, the chicken, I'm going to go ahead and just get two gloves on. Um, we wanna peel the skin off. The skin was really, really functional during the poaching process because it did protect the meat from becoming overcooked. But now we have no more use for the skin. You like the streams? Well, I'm happy to provide Duke McNasty. If you love him, check out my Patreon, exclamation mark Patreon. Sorry to shill, but I wanna make this a full-time thing. So guys, first step, we're going to remove all of the tendons from the chicken legs, okay? And we're going to remove the skin. Okay, okay, chat, chat, relax, please. This is a family-friendly show, genuinely, it is. 
Not even for frying, they're already boiled. So, I mean, I guess you can try, but I have no use for them. I really have no use for them at the moment. Okay, and now I'm just going to take this, of course, and we're going to just shred this up ever so slightly. There you go. Okay, and again, we're just inspecting all of this for any remaining tendons whatsoever. Right, we're getting rid of any of the skin. Also, Dirk McNasty, thank you so much for this prime sub. I really, really appreciate it. So you see this tendon right here, guys? We're just going to go ahead and pull that out. Right, and there's some meat alongside it, so we just want to go ahead and tear that. Nice. And now, we can go ahead and easily just pop out the rest of this meat from the chicken leg. Just like so. Lovely. Gorgeous. And we don't need this bone anymore. And now guys, all I'm going to do, I'm going to be feeling through this for any little bones, for any little tendons. We're going to go ahead and put, like you see this guy? You see this little squiggly bit? We have no use for this in the salad. I want a nice, delicious, clean salad. As delicious as chicken legs are, they can be somewhat cumbersome. Okay, and now we're just shredding it up slightly. We're not completely destroying it, but we're just slightly, but surely shredding all of it up. There you go. Nice. Excellent. We have a little bit of a vein here. You can keep that in if you would like. There we go. And guys, look how tender and look how delicious my chicken is. We cooked it so gently. We gently, gently poached the whole thing, right? Um, chef, I busted down a pair of chickens for stir fry. The drumstick tendons are vexing. Is it fine to just stock those bad boys? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. You can, you can, uh, you can just stock them. Okay. So that's one of the chicken legs that we've now officially broken down, guys. I'm going to just go ahead and put that directly into the salad bowl. And let's move on to the next chicken leg. So how do you avoid eating half the food? Really good question, Dirk McNasty. Uh, to avoid eating half the food as you're doing this, you take a cup of coffee beforehand, and then you're so stimmed up that you don't want to eat. You make sure to cook when you're not hungry. That is my genuine piece of advice. Don't cook when you are hungry. It is cumbersome for so many different reasons. So yeah, you see this tendon, guys? We just pull that bad boy off. We have no use for it, okay? We have a couple tendons. We're gonna go ahead and get rid of them. Okay, we've cleaned up all the skin, and now we can just go ahead and just twist off all the meat from the leg. There you go. It's all coming off. That's when you know you need to eat. So seriously, I do mean it by the way. Cooking when you are hungry comes with a lot of different challenges. One of them is of course that you do end up snacking. And then when you do cook when you're hungry, you do end up rushing everything. So it does become a bit of a headache. Okay, again, I'm just tearing this up a little bit. We're not looking to completely shred and decimate this. Right? We're just looking for very, very, you know, we're looking for like medium sized threads and stuff. Although you can shred this as finely uh, as you would like, the finer that you shred it, the more it's actually going to retain uh, the dressing and the dipping sauce that we end up putting on, right? So that is the benefit of it. Mm. Maybe one is a little snack, as a little treat for me. That is good. And you are really getting like those aromatics. I'm surprised how much they're even coming through in this stage, right? Like all the ginger, all the garlic, you really do taste it. Mm. Mm. Lovely. It really does remind me of like a Hainanese chicken. Okay, so the chicken thighs are a little bit easier, guys. You just have to peel off the skin, right? It just comes off. And then the rest of the meat just falls right off of the bone, right? And then we're just going to once again inspect it. Right? But this step is a lot easier with the thighs. Okay, so we're just going through all of this. We're just peeling all of it up. I'm feeling through any hard lumps of any kind that I wouldn't want in the salad. And we're continuing to just shred it all up, guys. Krista, okay, you need to stop. That's like kind of obnoxious and doesn't make me feel good. So I, I need you to stop doing that or one of my mods are gonna take care of that. Thank you. Oh wait, what, hold on. Did I misinterpret your message? Did I just freak out on you for no reason? I might've freaked out on you for no reason. Although, no, that wasn't any window, that was. Maybe, I'm not sure. I might've completely misinterpreted your intentions. I'm moving on. I apologize if I did. Okay, guys. So, one last chicken thigh. Let's go ahead and get through it all. Let's go ahead and pop that bone out nice and easy. Yeah, there's really nothing else to get rid of. And we're just going ahead and, okay, in this case though, we did leave some of the joint on from when we did break it down. Okay. So just going through all of this, feeling all of the meat, Getting all of it nicely and beautifully broken up. There you go. Into the pot. Into the bowl, excuse me. There it is. Nice. 
What if you cooked the chicken and it was still alive? I feel like there would be a lot of issues. There would be a lot of problems here to address in that case. Um, okay, there we go. Wonderful. Guys, guess what? We have officially shredded up all of the chicken that we need for the salad today. So now we can go ahead and get rid of all of this stuff. All right, we are now finished with this plate. We are finished with the cutting board. And then we're going to be moving on into the final stages, which is the part that I am the most excited about for today. So is everybody ready for this? We're going to now mix up the salad really, really beautifully. And again, I like using my hands for this is because that way we get to really like distribute the meat and break up all the clumps of cabbage, right? We really need to break up those clumps of cabbage, get all of the meat nice and beautifully throughout. There you go. And then we're about to get into the most exciting part of today. Oh, there it is. Look at that. That is the basis of an incredible salad, guys. It's full of protein, it's full of vegetables, it's got so much flavor, but we're not done yet because this salad is incomplete. This salad is incomplete without the dipping sauce, guys. So I'm gonna go ahead, I'm gonna take my cutting board, I'm gonna clean it off using my bench scraper. There you go. Cleaned off really, really nicely. And now we have to think about the aromatics that are going to be going into my molcajete. Um, and I have to also talk about something really quickly um, in regards to like actual traditional usage uh, and what kind of tool that you would be using. I'm using my molcajete, it's a Mexican tool, right? Uh, used in a lot of like Latin American, fam or, you know, Latino families. Um, but, um, you know, traditionally you would use like a wooden mortar and pestle. So like really like pound and make this dressing. This is going to be more of a grinded dressing. And so we'll talk about it in just a moment. So. Everybody, let's go ahead and begin and figure out what we actually need for this. So we're going to need a little bit of ginger. It's going to be raw ginger, so we don't need too much of it. So I'm only going to cut off eh, approximately that much ginger. And I'm just going to go ahead and peel it because all of this is going to go into my mortar and pestle food today. All right, it's okay if I'm wasting a little bit of it off. That's just fine by me. Okay, let's go ahead and get rid of all of that. Ignore what I just did, that was bad for him. We only need a little teeny tiny amount of ginger, guys. I hate having too much ginger. It easily overpowers everything else. Okay. So that's this one guy. And now we're going to need three garlic cloves. And the garlic cloves, we're just going to go ahead and smash them. Is there non raw ginger? Like, what do you mean, Sugita? I'm not sure what you're asking me. Like pre-cooked ginger? You see fermented ginger and then you cook with ginger, of course. I'm not sure if you can buy pre, I'm not sure what you're asking me. Okay. Let's go ahead and take these garlic cloves, guys, and we're going to go ahead and give them a slight smash. Slight little smash, slight little tap. Oh, um, all, I mean, um, Serena, I'm sorry, I'm a little bit confused about what you're trying to get at here. Uh, there is like tube ginger, but actually its pungency is a lot different than fresh ginger. And then there's a couple of varietals of ginger as well. It's not something I'm an expert on, but no, there is no like pre-cooked ginger that you buy. Although pre like tube ginger, it's a very different product from, um, from this. I would not buy pre-tube ginger. Unless it's like a garlic ginger paste and you do like a lot of like Indian cooking. I wouldn't really do that. Okay guys, a couple more. Although a knife is faster than a spoon is recommended overall, a spoon is just like a little bit less wasteful is the only difference. Um, because then you're just like able to really easily scrape it without getting any of the flesh lost. So I'm trimming off the butts of each of my garlic cloves, guys. Okay, trimming those off, beautiful. Okay, garlic, ginger. Now, let me just go ahead and clean up my station again. Next, my bird's eye chili. Well, not my bird's eye chili, in this case, my Serrano chili, because that's what I had at home. And that's what it means to cook at home, guys. Okay, I'm just going to go ahead and just cut it up into little pieces. And that's all going to go into the mortar and pestle as well. So I'm just going to go ahead and throw that on in now. Excellent, there you go. And then the final step, guys, is going to be juicing a little bit of lime. And I actually kind of want to put some scallions in here. I don't think scallions are particularly traditional in this, but um, we're going to do some lime juice and some scallions. I think that'll be really, really nice. So 
We're going to take my lime. I'm going to go ahead and cut it in half. Everybody, if you don't already own one, I really recommend investing in a good tissue suit. Flesh side down uh, and not flesh side up. Okay, and you're going to go ahead and give this a nice big squeeze. And we're going to go ahead and pour that right on in. Okay, lovely. And the reason we're pouring the lime juice directly in with the other aromatics is because it's actually going to prevent the garlic from becoming too pungent. Right, and then the rest of it I'm actually going to save because we don't know how acidic the lime juice is going to be today. So just go ahead and pour that in. I'm going to go ahead and save that for later in case it's needed. And one last little step of prep that I'm going to do and just get rid of is I'm going to just chop up one scallion, right? And this is also going to just go into my molcajete. So this is just to really help size it down. Cause I was thinking, I think some like pounded scallion in here would also be really, really nice. Okay guys, that is all of the prep that we needed to do for the actual molcajete, for the actual pounding and the grinding that we need to go ahead and get done. I'm going to go ahead and just transfer all of this lovely scallion on over into a separate bowl because it's not going to be added in at the same time as the other aromatics. So, lime juice, we set this aside because we don't know when we're going to need it. We have some chilies, some garlic, some ginger, and lime juice all together, and then these are my scallions. Everybody, I'm going to now go ahead and just take a second and clean up my station. I'm gonna clean up my station and I'm going to set up the molcajete. And we're going to talk about why we're doing this and what we're doing here and what we're actually, you know, physically accomplishing. So just quickly cleaning this off, cleaning my knife off. Nice. And I'm gonna go ahead and get rid of my cutting board as well. Um, and then we'll, we'll do it, we'll get it done. So everybody, this is the, you know, to me, the heart and the soul of this kind of a dish. This is going to be the dipping sauce, right? So this is not what's going to directly go over the salad. Um, it's just going to go like in a little container on each person's plate that you would be serving the salad to. Um, and then they would pour over however much they would actually like for themselves. Um, does the material of a mortar and pestle affect the taste or am I just yapping? Cloud9, you are not actually just yapping. A molcajete, because of the grinding motion, it actually does affect the taste. You do get some of that ba uh, basalt, basalt, not really sure how to pronounce it. You do get some of it in your final product. Otherwise, it does not affect the final taste of it. It does affect the texture of it though. So you are on to the right idea there. So I'm going to go ahead and get everything transferred over to my dishwasher. And then we're going to begin the process of making this lovely dressing, guys. Just cleaning off my table, cleaning off my station as I go, because once again, this is indeed a home cooking show. And then I'm going to get my multi-hete station nicely and beautifully set up with a towel so that it doesn't scratch my table. Okay, so guys, back here, my towel is now set up, and now my big, beautiful, Molcajete is going on. So what is the beauty of a molcajete? A beauty of a molcajete is that it grinds like nothing else. It is able to go ahead. Okay. Mods, please and thank you. Um, guys, a molcajete is able to grind things down exceptionally well because of how coarse the inside of it is. It's not for pounding. It's not for actually crushing things. We're going to grind everything down. Now, is this a traditional tool that would be used in this type of cooking? No, in fact, you would just be doing a mortar and pestle, right? You would be doing a wooden mortar and pestle and it would be a lot of vertical pounding motion. I don't actually have a wooden mortar and pestle. So instead, I'm going to be adapting it to what I have. Um, so I'm making it authentic to my home kitchen, even if this is not the actual authentic way to do so. So guys, we're going to go ahead and start with a spoon of sugar. We're going to start with a spoon of sugar alongside a nice big old pinch of salt. And the sugar, again guys, Vietnamese cooking, Thai cooking, they're always, always about that balance. So we're adding in a teaspoon of sugar. Is there any style of cooking you're not confident in that you would like to learn more about? Vietnamese cooking, that's what I'm trying to do, right? And now guys, we're going to go ahead and get a nice big pinch of salt going inside. We don't need too much because the fish sauce is gonna be quite salty. And now the chili, the garlic, the ginger, and the lime juice. And now guys, we're going to begin by making this into a really, really lovely paste. We're taking the garlic and we're going ahead and we're grinding it up. We're not just crushing it, but we're making sure to use the full sides of our molcajete. And we're taking the chilies. And so traditionally, again, you would only like pound this and it would be like massive pieces of each. I wanted to do a grinded version. Is this traditional? It's not, but 
I wanted to adapt this into my home kitchen, into the kinds of tools that I have at home. Is there a maintenance thing that you have to do before or after? Yes, there is a maintenance thing before. Um, well, the first time that you use it, which would be the actual process of curing your mocajete, which is a pain in the ass, and I hate it. I love the smell of chili so much too. Yeah, they're the best. So the chilies, I'm actually not going to crush them up too much because I'm not looking to turn them into like a paste. It's only the garlic and the ginger that I'm really, really looking to transform into a paste. Okay. I do love the smell of chilies. They're really, really beautiful. Okay, and now I'm just gonna take a spoon and I'm going to just move everything back inside. Excellent. Ooh, I have like a little divot in my mocha hit and it's like kind of getting like filled up. There you go. Okay guys, let's go ahead and continue to just grind. I'm using the full surface. I'm twisting as I go as well. We're mashing it, we're twisting it, we're grinding it all down. And again, I'm not really focusing on the chilies too much because I would like that to be kept um, in chunks, okay? And now, this is going to be the basis for it. And now I'm going to go in and add my scallions. Again, this is not a traditional addition. Um, I just wanted to get like some nice crushed scallions. I wanted to get like that allium flavor. So I'm taking the scallions and I'm grinding it. I'm grinding it alongside my molcajete. And it's doing an amazing job of just, it's doing quick work. It's pressing it down. It's processing everything beautifully. We're not looking for like an onion paste. We're not looking for like a scallion puree, guys. We're just looking for the gentlest and gentlest of grinds on it. Okay, just make sure that everything gets a little bit smashed, everything gets a little bit processed, because it's all going to contribute into the final product. There you go. Um, I don't think I wanna actually put my fish sauce directly inside of this, because fish sauce is so pungent, and because this wood is so porous, I think it might actually um, spread to like other things that I make later on. So I'm going to go ahead and pull all of this out, and I'm going to put it into a different vessel. So this, guys, is going to be the basis of this incredible sauce that we're building. It's aromatic, it's flavorful, you're getting the ginger, you're getting so many different components out of it. I'm going to go ahead and take my little condiment bowl, that is a massive molcajete. And I'm just going to take everything and I'm going to spoon all of it out. All of it out. And then we're going to mix in, of course, some fish sauce and a little bit of water to go ahead and finish all of this up. Does anybody have any questions about this process? And this sauce, guys, it's going to be pungent. It's going to be pungent, it's going to be strong, it's going to be intense, it's going to be aromatic, it's going to be delicious. So do not sleep on it whatsoever. So I'm just taking my spoon, I'm scraping everything out, although a wooden spoon would be probably better. How do I judge what goes in a molcajete versus not? The only thing I'm abstaining from is I'm abstaining from meat and I'm abstaining from um, something like fish sauce, which is completely like liquidy and could easily permeate it. Otherwise, I would just do just about anything else. And the reason I'm not doing raw meat is just like a sanitary thing because I don't wash this out with soap, right? because the stone is so porous. Although you could theoretically wash it with soap, immediately rinse it out and be fine. Okay guys, so all of that has now been officially scooped out. Excellent. Ooh, I need to go ahead and take my salad bowl back. And now everybody, it's time to do the final touches on this incredible, delicious sauce that we're building. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to go ahead and take a couple of nice spoons of our fish sauce. How do I maintain it? Um, I make sure to wash it out uh, thoroughly with like a scrub, right? You want to use like a nice brush, you want to use like a nice scrub, and you really, really want to uh, scrub it. Okay. So here's what's going to happen, guys. Um, we're going to go in with um, some fish sauce. I'm roughly shooting for like, I don't know, maybe like a tablespoon or two. It's basically as much as you would like. What's going to happen is I'm going to add some fish sauce, I'm going to add some water, and then I'm going to just taste it. So I'm going to start with... Two, three, four spoons of fish sauce. And it's really, really pungent, guys. But I promise you, the acidity is going to do an excellent job of counteracting it. I'm going to add in a little splash of lime juice more. And then we're going to get some hot water or some warm water. Oh, look, I'm sure cold would be fine. And that's going to do a really nice job of diluting the sauce that we've made. Okay? Because again, we don't want it to be so concentrated and so pungent that we can't really eat it. And guys, that's it. Let's go ahead and now give this whole thing a nice, beautiful, proper taste. Mmm. Ooh. That is good. Oh my god. That dressing is amazing. It's acidic. 
it's fermented, it's pungent, it has everything that you could possibly want. That is really, really beautiful. Wow, and that's it. I'm actually just gonna add in a little splash of lime juice wine. It doesn't need anything else. We will be tasting for sweetness, we will be tasting for saltiness, we will be tasting for acidity. That is a perfect, perfect dressing. And now everybody, it is time for us to properly assemble the salad. Is everybody excited? I wanna hear the nice resounding yes chef. Wish there was a taste stream. Well, guess what? That's gonna be happening now. I wanna hear the nice yes chef from everybody that's here. So this is the kind of a salad that I want to do on a plate and not a bowl because I really wanna be able to show off all of my gorgeous toppings that I have going on it. So guys, here's what's gonna happen. I am go, oh, excuse me. I, I, never mind. I'm going to go ahead and take a nice, healthy, generous portion of the salad. Right, right on, right onto the plate. This is like, you know, four portions perhaps of salad that I have in my bowl. I'm going to just break it up so that it's not completely dense cabbage. Okay? And now I'm going to go in with, remember all of my incredible toppings, guys. Don't forget about my incredible toppings. We're going to go in first. Um, let's do my cilantro. Let's do some of my fresh cilantro right on top. Right? Right over there. I'm just gonna break up this so it's not, again, like one big cluster or anything. A bunch of fresh cilantro. Then, a bunch of my roasted peanuts directly on top. As many as you would like. As many as your heart desires. Okay? And then, I'm going to go ahead and top it off with one of my favorite components, actually. My crispy shallots. Nice and sweet, incredible. Can't actually have too many crispy shallots or anything. And guys, the final step, I'm going to go ahead and dose uh, some out. This is my really, really lovely dressing that we made with the fish sauce, with the lime juice, with the chilies. Okay, and we could just go ahead and put this on like with the plate, or in my case, I'm going to just do a still of this and see what happens. All right. Going ahead and just spooning all of it over. Here we go. This dressing is going to be lovely. And there we go. That's it. I don't actually know how good that looks or it doesn't. It might just kind of look like a mess on the plate, but that's okay. Guys, this is my take on the Vietnamese chicken cabbage salad on Goi Ga Bap Kai. Okay, it has a lot going on here that doesn't meet the eye. We have homemade crispy fried shallots. We have homemade pickled shallots. We have cabbage. We have beautifully poached chicken. We have a bunch of cilantro. We made this incredible, incredible, luxurious dressing. We have this dressing made out of lime juice, made out of, um, you know, chilies, out of garlic, out of ginger as well, out of a lot of fish sauce, because that's what uh, Vietnamese cooking is about. Vietnamese food is about all of these uh, like strong, pungent flavors and all of them coming together harmoniously. So I am now going to go ahead and take a nice, beautiful forkful. Mmm. Mmm. Oh my goodness. This salad has so much texture and so much flavor. You're getting the peanut crunch. You're getting the shallot crunch. You're getting so many different levels of acidity and sweetness and spiciness. This is a salad with layers and real serious flavor. And really healthy too. Mm. Mm. That is incredible. Mm. Mm. Mm, 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 mm. Wow. Mmm. There is so much texture. There is so much flavor. The salad is where it's at. Mmm. The chicken is nice and tender. You're getting all the ginger. You're getting all those aromatics. Mmm. That was incredible. Everything from scratch. We didn't sleep on a single component. We gave everything so much love, so much attention. That is a really good salad. Wow. 
Mm. Mm. That's chewy spinach. But okay, guys, that's it. That's my goi ga ga, uh, goi ga bakkai. It's a lot of syllables for me. Everybody, thank you so much for being here. I appreciate every single last one of you. Thank you for being here. If you haven't already done so, please check out my Patreon, exclamation mark Patreon. If you haven't checked out my Discord, exclamation mark Discord to join. You guys are the best. You guys are all the sweetest. I appreciate every single one of you for being here. There is no stream uh, this Sunday because reasons. Um, and uh, the stream, I'm going to just make up for it with this Monday stream, and then we'll get back into a regular schedule. Um, I appreciate every single one of you for being here. I'll see you in just a few days. This Monday, 5 p.m. EST, if you haven't already put it on your calendar, go put it on your calendar. Um, we're going to go ahead and sign off for tonight. Uh, goodbye, everybody. Thank you for being here. Bye-bye.